Yo Atlas speaking welcome back to the Atlas fanfic channel. This is part 2 of what if I was reborn in Naruto as Danzo Shimura. Let the tale begin. Chapter 7, Peace by Power I somehow managed to survive the little punishment that the Lady Hokage had thrown me into. At this point, I was sure that a deity was indeed keeping watch over me as my worst fears were squashed by a degree of somewhat pleasant changes. Yoshiko, despite the fact I was forcefully confined in the same house as hers for almost a full month, decided to shift most of her interest to the new addition of the village. She asked everything I knew, and I gave her the version that both Mito and Hashirama wanted me to relay every time someone asked about it. Madara found the bijou, he somehow stopped the beast from rampaging around, and he secured an ally to the village. Big boost to the Echiha clan, and the fact my sensei had to spend a lot of time with the Hokage to deal with his punishments, many saw it as a clear hint that both men were once again as close friends could get. It was good and bad. Good because the village didn't hate the Scary Eyes clan that much, and bad because most of the family decided to be pricks about their newfound reputation as grand diplomats. Q bickering between the two Senja brothers to get something to put an end to any internal issue happening because of this troublesome circumstance. It was eventually agreed upon to establish a police force that would operate against civilian and ninja criminals, but this time, it was not the Uchiha clan to get hold of that seat of might. In fact, the clan that was to control it from the time being was none other than the one led by Sasuke Saratobi. Surprise, surprise, with the fact that some of the issues were created by morons from the Echiha clan, it was easy to sway Madara to see Haruzen's father as a good leader of a peacekeeping group within the village. The Saratobi clan was particularly friendly to the Echiha clan, so it wasn't that unpleasant to have this candidate as the proper choice for both powerful men. Paperwork was signed, hands were shaken, and orders started to be restored by tackling each case with the appropriate degree of diplomacy or violence. But with that ordeal coming to a quick closure, other issues started to arise the moment I tried to find peace after the punishment was over. The redhead girl that continued to pester me about the overgrown fur ball seemed to have stepped down her intense questioning, deciding that she had drained too much the source of info about that mysterious being. Karama was seen as a controversial creature. Some praised it as a good being, an omen for prosperity to come to this novel village, while others were just uncertain in how they were supposed to handle the fact that a massive kitsune was now watching over their homes. To be fair, knowing how dangerously powerful the QB was, I could understand the concern if not expect some more. But that didn't mean I was worried about that ever happening. Despite the minimal contact I had with the fox, the prick seemed to be rather receptive of my presence. Maybe better than most of the people approaching to leave gifts and sacrifices to appease the mighty Kitsune. It was an awkward meeting the one that saw me freeing the crying little girl that had been tied up and left in front of the bored bijou. It was even more frustrating having the family behind a minted act denounced to the police, especially with how superstitious and annoying these idiots turned out to be. Still, the talks that ensued were all worth the irritating waiting. Karama was keen to listen to my words, and it was all because of that quiet talk I had to give him to properly convince him of my goodwill and genuineness. But the question was clear? How do I convince a gigantic beast that I was being legit without leaving him any chances of retorting? The answer was surprisingly simpler than I expected it to be. I brought up Ashura and Indra. While many knew of the tale of the Sage of the Six Paths, it was difficult to find those that knew of the man's children. Both individuals were legendary in their own way, with Indra being the one that rediscovered the Sharingan and its full potential, while his younger brother was the first Jinchuriki after Hagoromo Oetsutsuki, the sage himself. With the former dignified with disdain, and the latter seen as the legacy of the sage's peace-filled dream, Kurama found himself intrigued by the fact their reincarnations were actually cooperating for once by forming the first ninja village ever. Sure, the bijou required proof before accepting this last bit, but when he had the chance of first looking at Hashirama and comparing him to his last friend, he could tell that there was a resemblance. Both in mind, body, and spirit. 
This was the confirmation of his interest in staying in Kanoha and curiosity to know more about my bizarre existence. He listened, he offered advice, but most of all, he enjoyed teasing the ever-living out of me. The moment I spoke to him about my red-haired problem and how she had been pestering me about Karama was enough to get the fox to snort and grin at my sorrow. It was pure entertainment, of the kind that just couldn't be denied by someone like him. Dark humor, and with me being the prime target of most of the damage. Maybe it was exaggeration at times, but the sparring was brutal enough with Madara, it didn't help that Mito decided to have fun with both me and Yoshiko by teaching us how to properly fight. Any worry of hurting the pregnant woman were gone after six thunderous rounds of crushing defeats. Those were the moments where I actually bonded with the fellow kid, with the girl happily seeing the issue the same way I always did. Mito was crazy, and her pregnancy made her easy for her to go ballistic at anyone. With the punishment ending and my life returning back to normalcy, I expected things to go my way for once. A few months of relative peace, maybe some investigation to intercept Zetsu before Plan Dude could make a terrible mess of this timeline, and maybe, just maybe, get two more abilities in my arsenal. But of course, I wasn't to be spared by hell itself. The classroom was quieter than usual. This very detail not only was absurd since the place was filled by children which weren't exactly known to be quiet. Even ninja children needed to be pests from time to time, but then again, today wasn't a normal day. No, it was far from being a normal one. The major twist, the very element that brought this much silence, was currently standing beside the teacher. Long dark hair, a neutral scowl on his face, a pair of white eyes, yep, the Hyuga clan had finally decided to join Kanoha. Not much of a surprise, but I was quite confused as to why it took so long for them to become part of the village. If I could remember correctly, there were illusions of them having joined among the first clans, but considering how long that part of the lore happened and how many old clans withered out before the beginning of Naruto, I could tell part of it was propaganda. At least part of it. While I would have normally seen this addition as a new entry to the ranks of the next generation of soldiers loyal to the village, I could tell that this boy, this guy that I had a slight clue could have been Hayashi and Hizashi's father, was not planning to make friends. At least not when his stare was so intensely aimed at me. And not that this guy is cool kind of stare that I knew only from fangirls right now, but that this guy, he is strong, I need to make him submit in a cool way kind of look. Another cliché, another stereotype. Yep. I could tell that there was something anime in this wacky world for sure. Please, introduce yourself to the classroom. The boy nodded, his stare still fixed to my frame. My name is Hyuga Hiratata, heir to the mighty Hyuga clan. Grand introduction, I could have applauded it if I didn't know that would have enabled the prick to escalate this frustrating situation. Yet the mighty Hyuga sure proved to be dim when it came to those he wasn't paying attention to, especially when those easily outnumbered within the classroom. So while I was merely granting him a lazy glance, most of the Uchiha kids were glaring at him with unrestrained anger and quiet promises of rebuttals to his superiority. Oh boy, Hiratata's stay at the academy was sure going to be a sad one if he was hellbent about being a pest to me. I wasn't going to do anything to him until he did something I didn't like. Like farting in my general direction since that would really vex me immensely. I somehow managed to survive the little punishment that the Lady Hokage had thrown me into. At this point, I was sure that a deity was indeed keeping watch over me as my worst fears were squashed by a degree of somewhat pleasant changes. Yoshiko, despite the fact I was forcefully confined in the same house as hers for almost a full month, decided to shift most of her interest to the new addition of the village. She asked everything I knew, and I gave her the version that both Mito and Hashirama wanted me to relay every time someone asked about it. Madara found the bijou, he somehow stopped the beast from rampaging around, and he secured an ally to the village. Big boost to the Echiha clan, and the fact my sensei had to spend a lot of time with the Hokage to deal with his punishments, many saw it as a clear hint that both men were once again as close friends could get. It was good and bad. 
Good, because the village didn't hate the Scary Eyes clan that much, and bad because most of the family decided to be pricks about their newfound reputation as grand diplomats. Q bickering between the two Sinja brothers to get something to put an end to any internal issue happening because of this troublesome circumstance. It was eventually agreed upon to establish a police force that would operate against civilian and ninja criminals, but this time, it was not the Uchiha clan to get hold of that seat of might. In fact, the clan that was to control it from the time being was none other than the one led by Sasuke Saratobi. Surprise, surprise, with the fact that some of the issues were created by morons from the Echiha clan, it was easy to sway Madara to see Hiruzen's father as a good leader of a peacekeeping group within the village. The Saratobi clan was particularly friendly to the Echiha clan, so it wasn't that unpleasant to have this candidate as the proper choice for both powerful men. Paperwork was signed, hands were shaken, and orders started to be restored by tackling each case with the appropriate degree of diplomacy or violence. But with that ordeal coming to a quick closure, other issues started to arise the moment I tried to find peace after the punishment was over. The redhead girl that continued to pester me about the overgrown fur ball seemed to have stepped down her intense questioning, deciding that she had drained too much the source of info about that mysterious being. Kurama was seen as a controversial creature. Some praised it as a good being, an omen for prosperity to come to this novel village, while others were just uncertain in how they were supposed to handle the fact that a massive kitsune was now watching over their homes. To be fair, knowing how dangerously powerful the QB was, I could understand the concern if not expect some more. But that didn't mean I was worried about that ever happening. Despite the minimal contact I had with the fox, the prick seemed to be rather receptive of my presence. Maybe better than most of the people approaching to leave gifts and sacrifices to appease the mighty Kitsune. It was an awkward meeting the one that saw me freeing the crying little girl that had been tied up and left in front of the bored bijou. It was even more frustrating having the family behind a minted act denounced to the police, especially with how superstitious and annoying these idiots turned out to be. Still, the talks that ensued were all worth the irritating waiting. Kurama was keen to listen to my words, and it was all because of that quiet talk I had to give him to properly convince him of my goodwill and genuineness. But the question was clear? How do I convince a gigantic beast that I was being legit without leaving him any chances of retorting? The answer was surprisingly simpler than I expected it to be. I brought up Ashura and Indra. While many knew of the tale of the Sage of the Six Paths, it was difficult to find those that knew of the man's children. Both individuals were legendary in their own way, with Indra being the one that rediscovered the Sharingan and its full potential, while his younger brother was the first Jinchuriki after Hagoromo Oetsutsuki, the sage himself. With the former dignified with disdain, and the latter seen as the legacy of the sage's peace-filled dream, Kurama found himself intrigued by the fact their reincarnations were actually cooperating for once by forming the first ninja village ever. Sure, the Bija required proof before accepting this last bit, but when he had the chance of first looking at Hashirama and comparing him to his last friend, he could tell that there was a resemblance. Both in mind, body, and spirit. This was the confirmation of his interest in staying in Kanoha and curiosity to know more about my bizarre existence. He listened, he offered advice, but most of all, he enjoyed teasing the ever-living out of me. The moment I spoke to him about my red-haired problem and how she had been pestering me about Karama was enough to get the fox to snort and grin at my sorrow. It was pure entertainment, of the kind that just couldn't be denied by someone like him. Dark humor, and with me being the prime target of most of the damage. Maybe it was exaggeration at times, but the sparring was brutal enough with Madara, it didn't help that Mito decided to have fun with both me and Yoshiko by teaching us how to properly fight. Any worry of hurting the pregnant woman were gone after six thunderous rounds of crushing defeats. Those were the moments where I actually bonded with the fellow kid, with the girl happily seeing the issue the same way I always did. Mito was crazy, and her pregnancy made her easy for her to go ballistic at anyone. With the punishment ending and my life returning back to normalcy, I expected things to go my way for once. 
a few months of relative peace, maybe some investigation to intercept Zetsu before Plan Dude could make a terrible mess of this timeline, and maybe, just maybe, get two more abilities in my arsenal. But of course, I wasn't to be spared by hell itself. The classroom was quieter than usual. This very detail not only was absurd since the place was filled by children, which weren't exactly known to be quiet. Even ninja children needed to be pests from time to time, but then again, today wasn't a normal day. No, it was far from being a normal one. The major twist, the very element that brought this much silence, was currently standing beside the teacher. Long dark hair, a neutral scowl on his face, a pair of white eyes, yep, the Hyuga clan had finally decided to join Kanoha. Not much of a surprise, but I was quite confused as to why it took so long for them to become part of the village. If I could remember correctly, there were illusions of them having joined among the first clans, but considering how long that part of the lore happened and how many old clans withered out before the beginning of Naruto, I could tell part of it was propaganda. At least part of it. While I would have normally seen this addition as a new entry to the ranks of the next generation of soldiers loyal to the village, I could tell that this boy, this guy that I had a slight clue could have been Hayashi and Hizashi's father, was not planning to make friends. At least not when his stare was so intensely aimed at me. And not that this guy is cool kind of stare that I knew only from fangirls right now, but that this guy, he is strong, I need to make him submit in a cool way kind of look. Another cliché, another stereotype. Yep, I could tell that there was something anime in this wacky world for sure. Please, introduce yourself to the classroom. The boy nodded, his stare still fixed to my frame. My name is Hyuga Hiratana, heir to the mighty Hyuga clan. Grand introduction, I could have applauded it if I didn't know that would have enabled the prick to escalate this frustrating situation. Yet the mighty Hyuga sure proved to be dim when it came to those he wasn't paying attention to, especially when those easily outnumbered within the classroom. So while I was merely granting him a lazy glance, most of the Uchiha kids were glaring at him with unrestrained anger and quiet promises of rebuttals to his superiority. Oh boy, Hiratata's stay at the academy was sure going to be a sad one if he was hellbent about being a pest to me. I wasn't going to do anything to him until he did something I didn't like. Like farting in my general direction since that would really vex me immensely. The young woman nodded, and only now I realized that it was just her in the room with me as the two other guards had left for other tasks. Yes, father. Father? She quietly left my side and slowly went to take the other seat beside the clan leader. So she was Hiratata's older sister? It was kind of saddening to realize that she had to have spent the first ten years of her life in pure happiness as she was the only child to Hayato, and then she was forced to take the seal when her brother was born. Kind of unfair, just like the others that were stuck in her same predicament. I really should press for those few injutsu lessons Mito had mentioned a while ago. Even if it means dealing with Yoshiko for that long. Shimura-san, You've been summoned to be inquired about two possible slights you may have dealt to my son, Hiratana, the man spoke again, sounding formal, but also slightly annoyed. And it has come to my attention that both were committed willingly to dishonor the Hyuga clan. Slights, Hyuga-sama? My son was targeted by various members of the Echiha clan, members that he says were ordered by you to have him harmed, he started to explain with a tenser tone. Then you refused to accept his challenge to end the hostilities between you and him. I frowned at the instances, trying to remember what happened mere hours ago. There was no chance that he might have mistaken anything I did as me ordering him bullied. I wasn't that petty, or else I wouldn't have been that good with instructors to begin with since the teachers were always keeping an eye out for any dumb bully in their classrooms. And I wasn't one of them. Then I tried to think about that following slight, the one of me not accepting a challenge and I could barely remember anyone saying something about it. But I had been focused on something way too important to ignore. A conversation that I had to pay utmost interest and vehemence to defend my points and value. Hyuga Sama, if I may inquire, what proof does your heir have to confirm these grave accusations? 
Hayato looked surprised. Truly a well-educated conversationalist, Shimura-san. But the answer is limited to just my son's word. Which was a lot in his opinion since it was his son's word against mine. By all accounts, the father had all reason to trust Hiratana and distrust me for being an unknown element. Yet he seemed willing to listen to my side of the story to try and find the truth instead of tearing me apart with baseless accusations. Could it be that there was a degree of doubt regarding his son's words? Did this happen before and he was now cautious how to handle this? I suppose my word will matter little, which is why I'm glad I can count on Tanaka Sensei's own recounting if there is a need for it. Hiratado looked confused for a moment, failing to remember who was Tanaka and Are you referring to your sensei that introduced my son to the classroom? I nodded. Yes. You see, Hugasama, the reason why your son was attacked was actually a mistake he had inadvertently committed by introducing himself, rather strongly. The man frowned. How so? Citing Hiratada-san, he said, My name is Hyuga Hiratada, heir to the mighty Hyuga clan. Which, while it's a good statement to display the power of the clan, it can also gain the ire of those that believe their clans to be the mightiest. The Uchiha clan, Hayato guessed correctly. I can see that being taken unwell by the children of that clan. And yet I find myself asking about your private talk with one of the ringleaders. Once again, I found myself frowning. Ringleader? The only Uchiha I spoke with today was Kagami Kuenin. It was about a little issue we had a little before Hiratana san joined the academy. What about? My heir said it was a pretty heated argument. So he was spying on us. Next time, I need to take extra precautions to stop stalkers from eavesdropping. Well, I might have asked Kagami Kuen to be my target practice for a jutsu he found rather unpleasant, I replied with a slightly annoyed voice. It was the hiding like a mole technique and he was rather cross that I wanted to have him as a target more than ten times. I've heard that the technique claimed many strong men's lives, the clan leader pointed out. Mostly those that tried to use the ability to bring allies out of a dangerous situation only to end up killing their teammates. I held a flinch back since I did hear of those dreadful rumors. But they were rumors, so there was no reason to worry and nag like Kagami was. This spat was just senseless, and I knew that it would take him a day or two to finally let this go and be my target practice again. There was no way in hell I was going to let go of that demand. Not even if he somehow managed to learn how to make blood clones. I'm rather experienced with it, and I know his height properly to not go overboard with the jutsu, Hugasama, I replied curtly, unwilling to spare more on the topic. It was a private affair about trust, friendship, and target practices privileges. I will just assume that you will handle this situation without going too far. Still, while this explanation does conform to what I've heard myself from Tanaka Sensei Dash, the response made his son tense up in shock, just now realizing that Hayato did check with the teacher before calling up this meeting. I believe you've yet to express your defense over the second offense. My stare turned down to the ground. The only thing I recall coming close to this was while I was busy in a heated conversation with Haruzen Kuen and Yoshiko Chan, I remarked politely. We were embroiled in a silly conflict of which natural affinity was better. And what is your opinion on that? Wind can make so many amazing things. Indeed, I mean, natural affinity isn't something the clan cares much about, the clan leader quickly corrected, looking awkward just for a brief moment as his son looked at him in temporary shock at that unneeded tangent. Still, I suppose that you didn't ignore Hiratana on purpose. Rather, you were requested such an important question in a moment where you were distracted. I nodded. That would be the case. Then I don't see any ground to challenge you for any of the accusations my son has reported, the man ultimately announced, ignoring the younger Hugo's shocked and humiliated expression. And I think I've taken a lot of your precious time by having this farce go on for so long. Hayato turned to his daughter. Himiko, Please escort Shimura-san back home. 
I wouldn't want him to skip his homework. The young woman nodded, tensing up as my attention was once more to her as she stood up and started to make my way towards me. Her face grew pinker once more, but instead of managing through what was causing her this much embarrassment, something unique and mostly dreadful happened before my eyes. If not for this very scene, I would have left Himiko as the shy girl with no general problems I should have worried about except the voluptuous frame she got despite her young age. But then, as she was mere meters away from me, she had to trip. She leaned and fell forward, her quickened pace made the soft tackle reach for me as I found myself pushed on the ground without notice and my face pressed down by something soft. Pillow, my naive mind initially thought as I was really craving for a nap once I was done with my homework. But then the context struck me and I felt the horror of the scene finally siphoned inside my brain. Eep! Himiko, she became the harbinger of what some animes just couldn't exist without. Especially if said anime was Naruto, and I was a young boy. And while that sudden tackle was ruled out as an accident by the clan leader, I knew better than leading it as just that. And with good reasons. I knew that this was a sign. The beginning of something that I needed to be afraid of as soon as the illusion of innocence from my young age would eventually fade away the moment I would grow up. For maturity was going to give a reason for this new issue to react violently the moment this antic is left untouched or unchanged. For the first time in my young life, I really wanted and needed a trustworthy and responsible adult to be around me 24-7. Sadly enough, I got paired with Madara and his unique antics. Chapter 8, Peace by Power Why is that Hyuga that mad at you? While Saratobi was a little more cautious with his confusion regarding the newfound issue I was going to handle for years to come, Kagami had decided to already flaunt his friendship by outright asking about this situation. And the boy didn't seem to mind that the lazy tone he used to address the matter only fueled Hiratata's glare aimed at me. Truly impressive how it was so easy for my newfound training dummy had decided to extend his privileges around me. People lesser than me would have found this attitude worthy of scorn and annoyance, but I was more than fine to concede him this much. After all, I wasn't in the mood to have a redo of what had happened in the last few weeks. I really didn't want to sign another friendship peace treaty with Kagami that would see me offer the boy a weekly allowance in the form of two licorices. I scratched my chin, missing my short beard since it would give me extra satisfaction to the scratching. I believed he might hate me, I flatly confessed, keeping my attention aimed at the teacher as both the Uchiha and I were still giving a higher priority to today's lesson. No need to get to lose any of the lectures about the grand education of Kanoha's first period of existence. Okay, I guess I'm going a little too far with the acting. Like, while it was true that some history and math were still there, it was nothing that I wasn't already aware of. Maybe there was a sage of the six paths that created chakra. Maybe there was a pantheon of gods that were mostly formed by Japanese deities. Maybe if Tom had seven antiques and Harry destroyed three of those in a fit of righteous justice, then there would be four troublesome soul anchors to deal with. I could go through an endless list of things that rendered this school system obsolete for someone like me. I didn't blame this society, I just blamed the fact that Divine Lottery had me take this role and handle a mixture of known canon and untold lore. I think three hours of sleep don't work well for me. Uh. Danzukuin, what is the result of this one? Yoshiko asked, sitting on the chair beside mine, right on the side that wasn't occupied by the Uchiha. The redhead proved to be quick with ninja-related stuff, but she found a worthy opponent in the form of math. Despite her noble upbringing, there wasn't a real reason for her to be bothered by this subject just yet. And that was until she joined the academy, right in the place where her father's clout couldn't protect her from the heinous monstrosities that were symbols and numbers. Sparing a quick glance on her paper, I merely hummed at first. Then I spoke with the calmest of voice. How did four become nine in the third line? The comment drew a frown from the girl, with the young Uzumaki looking back on her paper and tensing up. Oh! Oh, indeed! 
I really forgot how troublesome it was being the smartest kid and being glorified by many, while also hated by a good vocal group. Bullies weren't much of a thing at this stage of the academy, but I knew well enough that children needed just a little to snap into the most horrible beings possible. I was sure I was safe for now, but considering I had already someone with a hate boner fixed on me, I knew that the process was just going to get quickened by this variable. Much to my relief, the lecture ended and so the school day two was concluded. Spearheading a quick retreat from the classroom and out of the building to avoid giving reason to the Hyuga air of my maliciousness, I ended up sharing a curious conversation with Haruzan while Yoshiko and Kagami trailed closely behind. Did your sensei tell you about what is going to happen for next week? The brunette inquired, looking interested by the fact I was blissfully unaware of what was going to happen rather soon. Something big no huge. It was so massive that I almost broke in a brief tense pose as I realized how fate was already kicking my shin with her iron-tipped boot. More training? I asked unconsciously, knowing nothing of what the fellow boy was speaking of in. Hiruzen sighed, looking rather serious. The Hokage will be leading for the land of the fields. He mentioned a summit, but he didn't say who was invited to it. God damn it myself. Of course my decision to bring Kurama as an ally of the leaf would have made diplomacy a complicated mess. It was my fault that people were getting upset over the fact one of the players got a scary-looking kitsune that could rip apart an entire country with a single slam from one of his tails, and now something will have to be decided about the matter. Something that not necessarily will be any of the scenarios I favored for such a diplomatic endeavor. The First Kage Summit I was the main cause that led to its early convocation. It has to be about strong people. Isn't the land of the fields a crossroad between the four major lands? It could be a major border redistribution, Yoshiko quipped quietly. It's... I think Dad once mentioned something like this. Not to this extent, I shot down her suggestion with a distracted tone, my mind having yet to grasp at the magnitude of this issue. It will be bigger. Probably bigger than any events that have unfolded before the villages were formed. The trio of children regarded me with a confused look, and they slowly grew nervous at my unhappy mood about it. It couldn't be that bad, right? Kagami asked. Surely both the Hokage and Madara-sama will make people see that we don't mean any harm. Hashirama? Yes. I will never believe otherwise. Madara? Asking for peace through diplomatic means? Maybe I should start being less brutal with the use of some vicious technique I would bestow to the poor boy. His head was losing some gears already. We shall see as soon as more news are given about it and then dash. Didanza San. I tensed up again, this time my worry being directed away from the trouble brewing away from the village to the one that was currently boiling within Kanoha. Left hand raised up and waving, Himiko Hyuga looked ready to die by embarrassment for breaking off from her usual shy shell. The young teen stood out to the few adults that were waiting outside to pick their kids because of her height, but my attention was soon taken by the familiar rectangular box that the girl was grasping with her right hand. Yoshiko groaned and almost wanted to scowl at her acquaintance, while the two boys in my group were more than sympathetic over the horrible situation I had been pitted against. While at first I was legitimately worried about the older girl becoming a permanent issue for me to have to deal with, I was caught by surprise, at least partially, when the red-haired Izumaki took the new addition to my daily life with a forced smile and the promise of murder. I wasn't sure if I was expected to dread the day the true conflict would happen or feel morbidly proud of the fact I was the one that got Yoshiko to develop her murderous instincts so precociously. I wasn't even joking at this point. The redhead had a moment while we were sitting at lunch back at home where mom would bring Himiko up in the conversation. I never saw such a young child stab so furiously at her food that wasn't Brussels sprouts or other kind of veggies. But even though one side of the brewing war had already made a display of intentions, the other faction was seemingly unaware that there was trouble in paradise. 
Hiratata's sister didn't seem interested in pursuing any serious analysis of the situation, keeping her mind focused on issues her clumsiness might have been responsible about in recent times. The chart of her clumsiness took a sharp turn upward ever since I became a factor in her life. While she was usually an innocent troublemaker, the moment I found myself tied to her was the moment the world casted a curse on myself. The young woman wasn't at fault most of the time, with some awkward tripping ending up with me being smothered for no apparent reason. I was a kid, but my adult mind found it difficult to suppress any awkward thought of those instances. There were some funny nightmares of me hearing some car's sirens blaring around and dignifying the intrusion of a transdimensional FBI. Age wasn't just a number, and a prison cell wasn't just a room. The real horrible aspect of this whole ordeal was that to add some salt to the wounds and rub it in the most unconscious way possible, Himiko found something that could be used to apologize instead of awkwardly doing so through words. The box she was holding close to herself was a bento box. A gift to appease my outraged self for her silly mannerism. She was adorable all around, something that made me quite surprised that no teens her age had sought her hand already. I was quick to attribute that bizarre phenomenon to her father's unwillingness to let his daughter be with this early on. All guys that were as old as Himiko were carefully studied, bribed, and forced to not keep a strong friendship bond with the young woman. It sounded a little excessive, but there was a surprising number of noble girls that were taken advantage of by those that wanted to have reasons to blackmail the clan said girls were part of. On the one hand, I could understand the logic, but on the other hand I couldn't help but find the whole thing excessive and in need of a permanent solution. Some law that prevented this kind of accident from happening. Why is she here? Yoshiko finally asked, glancing at me intensely and demanding an answer. I believe she is, apologizing for what happened two days ago, I calmly replied, surprisingly unable to hold a proper glance aimed at the annoyed girl's face. Just like she did the last five times. I think she is doing it on purpose. I don't think so, I rebuked quietly, her glance turning in a glare. Why? She has plenty of opportunities to do, more. She didn't, I answered cryptically. Plus, I can tell that she isn't lying about her uneasiness after these accidents. It wasn't Himiko's fault that she was clumsy as fuck. I blame genetics being somehow involved in this bizarre family's trait. Eventually, I approached her, the Hyuga girl smiled and offered me the bento as an apology. I accepted it, but I politely declined spending some private time at the park so that she could apologize through her stuttering ways. While I would have normally accepted it, the truth was that I now had another reason to be at home for today. At first I was only concerned by the fact that Madara had decided to spend lunch at my house, but now I wanted to know some more about the Katya summit. There was no way in hell that I was going to allow this matter to remain untouched. And there was no way about everything that I was going to leave my sensei to clumsily romance my poor dense mother. No chance at all. When I was served the usual bowl filled with carrot soup and ramen, I found my mind quickly turning at the chances of unconsciously discovering how to make pasta. It would be difficult to explain why the dish would be more acceptable considering the surprisingly strong hold ramen had through the entire elemental nations, but I knew that some classic pasta al pomodoro was going to be enough to warm people's mind and hearts to accept the pasta god in their heart. I really miss home. And I really miss pizza. Ignoring the pangs given by the sudden nostalgia attack, I proceeded to keep my focus on the real problem within the small scene I was part of. My mother was happily enjoying her share of the meal, while Madara was stealing some not-so-subtle glances at the distracted woman. For once, I was glad that someone of my family was so clueless about this kind of stuff. And also confused as to how she got to see romantic feelings from girls aimed at me when she wasn't able to do the same for herself. I guess being a widow turned her more reluctant to believe in a second chance. A pity, but not one big enough that would have gotten me to bless any attempt from my sensei. The situation was quiet. It was far from becoming worthy of any intervention from my part since Madara had yet to leave the early stage of studying or admiring his prey. 
Like a hunter preparing a plan to hunt down a delicate dove, the man was taking notes of what he could use to win that challenge, only for his inexperience about romance to rule out any impressive topics he could bring to score some successful victory out of it. Instead of allowing this to happen, I decided to directly disrupt his preparatory phase with a calm question. So, land of the fields. Dark eyes shifted away from my mother's frame and right to my face. Hmm? The woman asked as she too took notice of my words. Did you say something, dear? I blinked. Just thinking about what I've heard just recently. Madara-sensei will leave for the land of the fields with Okage-sama. The widow looked surprised, turning to stare at our guest. Is that so, Madara-san? Just a flinch, that was how complicated for the Echiha clan leader was to keep this secret without compromising his chances with a good candidate for Mrs. Uchiha. I continued to keep my poker face as I enjoyed my ramen, knowing that any attempt to show smugness was going to disrupt my chances of getting some straight answers out of it. Indeed, the man blankly muttered. It's some serious business that shouldn't concern people within the village, especially young students. Ah, that's funny. Like, I'm dying by the fat laughs that are forcibly leaving my throat. I suppose nobody should care if five ninjas play a game of chess once in a while, I calmly rebuffed, getting Madara to narrow his eyes at me for being a cheeky brat with that remark. But then again, you're not a chess player yourself. You are more the person that likes punch problems, sensei. If something works, there is no reason to go for another approach, the powerful shinobi quietly shot back. And I recall you having your own secrets, Danzakuin. What? Danzakuin, what is your sensei talking about? I don't know, mother. It's not like I too was surprised by that strange comeback. It's nothing to worry about. Rather, it's an interesting detail that I don't understand why you would keep it away from the public eye. Madara's words seemed to ease mom's worries a little bit. The woman was still concerned, but looking quite unwilling to press too much on the matter. How about we make a trade of sorts? The Uchiha clan leader proposed. You show me the result of your little endeavor with Saratobi, and I will offer some insight on the event. In a normal circumstance, I would have been annoyed by such a demand. I knew that many would have outright refused this attempt of stealing a unique technique, but I wasn't worried about his pretty eyes being able to understand my jutsu. In fact, I had two strong reasons to doubt he would be able to accomplish it. First, the technique itself was far from being completed. Without the proper size of chakra reserves to help me with the taxing upkeep, I couldn't even keep its early form for long. But the more important bit was that this jutsu didn't have a hand sign. I shrugged, standing up from my seat and looking at him with a serious look. Mother looked confused, then worried that whatever I was planning to do would cause problems within the room. She seemed to stop in her effort to protest my demonstration when I held both of my hands in front of me, arching both palms as if I was grasping at a silent orb. At first nothing happened. Then a small blue light could be seen growing from the middle of that nothingness. A vortex that grew a little more, until stopping to a disappointing size. Heck, it was even worse than what Baruto could accomplish with that jutsu, but it was there. It existed in, it was a step in the funny direction. Madara Sharingan was now frowning over the mesmerizing sight, a mixed reaction made by disappointment of discovering that he couldn't copy it since it didn't require any hand sign and surprise that I could accomplish this. In part, I was feeling rather smug that I was having a reincarnation of Indra to almost salivate over the basis of Ashura's main mean shoe. The Raisingan looked pretty, but right now it was more harmless than a modest powered slap in the face. It didn't even last that long as I was forced to drop it, drops of sweat forming all over my body as I found myself straining over such a complicated technique. One could easily frown over the simple theory behind such a powerful jutsu, but I was given confirmation that such claim was absolutely bullshit. When I first tried it, I almost butchered my palm because of my stupidity having me lower the tiny semi-harmless sphere of pure chakra onto my skin. 
The result was a frightened jump and a small cut in the middle of my hand. Hiruzen was interested too, but he quickly noticed why I was cautious about practicing with him alone and away from others. The Raisingan was as deadly useful in good hands as it was horribly self-destructive if left in the hold of a moron like me. Three weeks of bashing my head against the wall of logic yielded this much. It was too little? I was five, I didn't have access to any of the balloons Naruto used to learn it, and I had little time to practice about it since it was my first secret project. Not much of a secret now that Madara had to blurt it out to someone else. I sat down back on my seat, trying to ignore my mother's odd look at such a pretty thing while also covering for the signs of the strain I was fighting against. It was a taxing process. While I couldn't get a full glimpse of it, I could see the chakra flowing as you molded that sphere, the Uchiha commented blankly, settling for a fascinated look as he regarded this. From what I understand, you're not using it too frequently. I need to build up more chakra dash, I tried to explain, only for the man to sigh. Your body can't process that much chakra just yet. Don't overexert yourself because you want to rush to that kind of power, says the one that literally rushed for the Chitsi Renegan strat. And I guess I should go through my promise, Madara continued with a solemn tone. You may ask me three questions. I nodded, giving out a thoughtful look before asking the first question. What is the general topic of the meeting? He sighed. Hashirama mentioned that the other Kages want to preserve peace after the deal we formed with the QB. Of course, it means that they will either demand their own tailed beasts delivered in silver plates or to have draining concessions imposed to the village to balance our newest advantage. I guess Hokage-sama has a plan to counter both circumstances, right? I quickly inquired about it. He will not bow to any concessions, but he seemed rather tempted by the first possibility which would mean a return to something of a canon event. It wouldn't be the same since Hashirama could force the villages to accept only defensive packs with their tailed beasts, at least preventing for a while the creation of the concept that was the Jinchuriki. I doubted some greedy bastard wouldn't jump at the opportunity to get raw ultimate power by sacrificing some malleable individual to attain this kind of might. Nodding, I decided to ponder a little more about the question I was supposed to ask next. There was just a lot that could be asked, and just a single chance to do so without failing to bring up the most important of queries. But as I was lost in that little brainstorming, Madara decided to be a prick and try to get this minor advantage I had over him foiled with a simple trick. Aren't you going to ask me if I will accept diplomacy over violence at this event? The ninja asked quietly, almost baiting me to speak up about this. Or maybe if I will accept any unfair treaty? I sighed, knowing that speaking up wrongly about this matter was just going to annoy me at best. Knowing Madara, there were just a couple of words that would disrupt this very attempt. While he was slowly growing to understand how I handled this kind of opportunity, he was far from having a serious control over my mostly insane mind. I believe you will not mess things, too much, I admitted with a nod but I have a real question that I wanted to ask you. He blinked, looking interested by the careful diversion. But I knew that he couldn't just reach the mysterious subject I wanted to address with that inquiry. If you're leaving for the land of the fields, who is going to train me in your absence? I. The man spoke quietly, his eyes lowering to the table as his mind quickly caught up with what I had just asked. You don't know. You didn't think about it, Sensei. I wasn't asking, but it was easy to see the clueless and despaired look that was now riddling Madara's usually stoic face. Once again, I managed to mess the man's mind a little bit. Not in a negative way, or at least not in the way that shoved him towards Zetsu. In fact, I knew that this banter would only tie him closer to the village since he wouldn't just be Madara, head of the Uchiha clan and co-founder of Kana de Kur no Sato but he would also be remembered as the teacher of the maddest shinobi Kanoha could have ever produced. A young boy with bits of adult-like personality clashing with dumb and childish moments. Not a flattery description for myself, but I knew people weren't going to laugh at it the moment I reached S rank in the bingo book. 
Still, Madara would take a while to find me a substitute. And boy, I was surprised when his pick proved to be one Hashirama himself wanted for me to have as teacher for a while. Chapter 9 Peace by Power Writing kanji isn't as easy as I had envisioned it when I tinkered about the idea. Sure, this very sentence is quite confusing considering that kanji makes up for most of the alphabet here and being unable to write in it was a sign that something was indeed wrong with me. The thing was that I wasn't exactly unable to write it, in fact I was more than capable of writing it with the whole brain understands things I did not know about until now predicament. The real issue was trying to make the kanji as proper as it should be. One of the many things that remained from my old life was that I liked to play alternative when it came to writing. It was something that got me scolded back at school for a while, from elementary up to the end of high school, but that I didn't have much control over it because of how much accustomed I was with my own style. It wasn't unruliness speaking, but rather a sense of detaching myself from the common. A streak of rebelliousness that was diluted in a sea of unwillingness to follow a standard I found mostly unfit for what I could do with a pen and a piece of paper. So when I realized that Mito-sama was going to be the new teacher for both me and Haruzen, I knew I had to expect Fuenjutsu to be an essential bit of that part of education. Not in the terms of high-tier ceiling techniques, but rather the standard that was known by many younglings back in Yuzushio Bikure. And I didn't mind, I really didn't. If I wasn't even able to properly make the simplest of sealing arrays, then I wasn't exactly in a position to demand four cooler bits to add to my arsenal. Knowing how complex Fuenjutsu was, I really wasn't making plans of risking exploding for the sake of getting better really fast. So, instead of allowing myself to spend the time I had before going to visit Mito without doing anything, I started to do something I had tried when I was a little kid in my previous life that I had given up after months of frustrating failures. I started to force myself into accepting the proper calligraphy. While the idea sounded incredibly dumb and quite painful to apply, the truth was mellower and doable. I needed to sharpen my hands into getting down the way kanjis were meant to be drawn, and that meant I would have to flawlessly copy kanjis from textbooks into empty papers small, numerous, and with each step adding corrections to my previous mistakes. The process wasn't meant to be solved overnight, but I went through four of the more complicated kanjis I couldn't write down in the correct manner. It was grueling work, but one that saw me actually happy with how far I went with just a couple of hours to start doing something while I was free from the homework. When the time came for me to leave home to visit the Hokage Manor for the first lesson with Mido, I felt ready to tackle whatever kind of early lecture we were going to receive this early in our journey through the madness that was the art of sealing. And boy, was I proven wrong about the concept of maturity I had about the redhead. The moment Hashirama wasn't around and only kids were there to keep her company, the woman saw it fit to throw away much of the standards of teaching people the basis and skip to something a little more advanced. Mito-sama dash. Auntie is fine, Dekuin. Auntie dearest, I reiterated even more uneasy with my tone. I don't believe we have enough chakra to go through these seals. I mean, I could have understood if it had been some higher version of the storage seal, but she wanted us to write down the proper combination to create a working sound silencing seal. While the name sounded cool, the real issue with this specific kind of seal was that it had a range of action that required multiple of those to affect even a small room, and a lot of energy to keep working for long amounts of time. That's correct. Which is why I believe it's best you test your affinity with seals with something you can't use even if you wanted, the woman said with a brief giggle. Even by putting all the chakra you have, I don't think you two might be able to achieve much with what you're preparing right now. And I wasn't exactly going to tell her she was wrong with that reasoning. I could actually understand the logic and albeit a little blunt and kind of annoying since I would have wanted to dive in with the storage seal first, I knew better than pushing for that so extensively. And then, we can go through the basis? She nodded happily. Yep. And I hope you're ready for the gruesome little step that is the storage seals. I frowned at her empty joy as she mentioned that specific topic. Maybe she found it too easy and thus wasn't looking forward to it? Was this why she was actually having us go for something that difficult this early on? 
I was the one thinking these questions, while Haruzan was putting a decent effort in being incredibly polite and being easily flustered by the motherly teasing coming from Mito. Her pregnancy sure was making her more emotional than she had been before. And I wasn't sure I should have picked this situation as a boon or something far worse than the usual. The fact we were handling seals in this very instance, and with Hashirama not being there meant that the woman had free reign with how she dealt with us. The only saving grace in those dark times was, much to my surprise, Yoshiko. The girl that would normally be a tentative friend, and a slow building problem for me to face when we were both going to be older, was sympathetic to our plight. I was quite certain that, from the way she was being quick to help us, the young redhead had some extra experience with this kind of issue compared to us. Enough to drive her to actually soften up the blow that was trying to get the good combinations of kanjis within the seal to have it properly work. And once the first one was done, after a number of attempts which saw my mind filled with foul words of various caliber, the next three were the ones that drove the insanity even out on my exterior. Hiruzen was spared by the full madness as he took his sweet time to get through the first half of his first paper, and thus not going through the sheer folly I had to endure before being able to get the second and third one done. Either I die writing this, or I'm going to become a saint of sorts once I'm done with this troublesome assignment. By the time I was beginning the fourth paper, the brunette had taken his leave to the bathroom, and thus leaving me to deal with a bored Mito and a fascinated Yoshiko as the young girl took hold of the first and third seal to study them closely. The girl had taken a seat near to me, quietly looking at what I was writing and how I was doing it. I could tell she was expecting me to fail at some point, so that she could try to get some cookie points by trying to give me some assistance on the matter. Funny thing was that I wasn't planning to fail, at least not so much to get immensely frustrated by it. Sadly enough for me, this still didn't deter the young redhead from speaking up about those I was already done with, leading to a couple of sudden interest from the occupants in the room. Auntie, did you see these? She asked, passing the papers to the woman as the older Uzumaki started to quietly study the current state of my progress. While she was quick to appear surprised at my hard work, a degree of perplexity resounded on her face as she studied the flawless seals. Dakuin, didn't I mention that it would have been best for you two to not go beyond two of the four papers? Mito inquired rhetorically, but I saw it fit to answer it since I could feel a storm brewing if I hadn't. I might recall something of that kind, Auntie, I muttered distractedly. Could either be that or make twice the required papers. A snort left her lips as the red-haired woman took the sarcastic response in a mirthful way. I believe you should stop now. Writing so many seals and going through countless attempts at once can be quite draining and dash. And I'm done, I interrupted with a relieved sigh as I delivered the last blasted paper to the redheads. The two Uzumakis frowned and shared a quick concerned look between each other before staring back at me. I wasn't joking, Dakuin. Fuenjutsu isn't something that you should rush to learn, and I believe you're already going through some mental stress as of now. Maybe I had a little headache. It wasn't anything too concerning to be actually scared of. In fact, I wasn't even feeling that much trained by the task despite how lengthy the process behind it had been for me to get through. Your hands are shaking, the woman commented, her worry rising as I noticed that my open palms were visibly shivering in front of my eyes. I tried to close those and try and get them to stop doing this unpleasant thing, but it didn't work. I believe you should take a pause, Danzakuin, Yoshiko spoke up, her eyes fixing on my hands for a little while and making me rather uncomfortable at the thought that I was having this much of a problem right now. Like, I had been training with Madara for more than just a month now. This was nothing compared to the training exercises I would usually need to go through to improve myself in, yet this very activity had left me in such a poor state. The sudden rise of pain from the headache, slowly becoming a migraine, didn't help my nerves in keeping up with my usual posture. I'm fine, I lamented curtly but tensely. I. I can do more. I don't believe you can, Mito rebuffed quietly. In fact, I think you would do better if someone saw you escorted back to your home and, given the rest of the day for you to find some sleep. I scoffed, 
my right hand reaching for my forehead and further intensifying the worry that I was receiving from the two Uzumaki. I wanted to say that I was doing well and that they were exaggerating my current conditions. But as soon as I saw my sight starting to grow less focused and more distorted, I knew that this was a big fat lie. One that eventually crumbled onto me when I felt my sensitivity falter and my tiny body collapse on the ground. My ears started to ring as all noises and sounds started to grow distorted, my sight growing even more blurry as my consciousness steadily left my body in the most unusual of situations. I couldn't do nothing, but brace for the darkness that waited for me on the other side. Only for me to be surprised by something far worse than I would have wanted. My head hurts. It wasn't the first time I had to face something so troublesome, but this migraine was still splitting my head open despite the fact I was aware that I was asleep. This very information was odd since that kind of pain shouldn't have trailed to my pseudo-dream, but it still did. And I was immensely confused because of it. The moment I opened my eyes in the surreal reality I woke up into, I started to look around this massive throne room I was incredibly unfamiliar with. I knew that this was a little too elaborate to be something born from my head since there were details that didn't fit with my preferences. Sure, I liked the simple columns on the side and I could see myself bringing those up in case I decided to build a palace for myself, but the rest of the room just wasn't fruit of my imagination. In fact, I was given further confirmation of this when I realized I wasn't alone in that throne room and I really wished I was when I got a proper look at who was with me in that bizarre scenario. Sitting in the single chair, or throne, of that place, the silver-haired pale-faced lady that was staring at me with a pair of Biakugan-like eyes seemed to be pondering if she should have attacked me at once or now. Her white robe was particularly simple, and the style reminded me of a kimono, only much longer and less detailed than the ones I had seen worn by other people. But I wasn't lingering for long with my staring as I saw the final hint of how screwed I really was and why I needed to leave at once. On her forehead was a single opening, one that slowly opened to reveal a third red eye with circles within it. It was her. It was the monster that was ultimately the final obstacle for peace in Naruto. And I was stuck in the same room with that terrible being without an apparent. Instead of contemplating fighting this illusion, I went through the standard plan in case I ended up finding myself dealing with people that wanted to kill and were morally ambiguous about sparing or killing people. I suppose it's time for... Nijirundeo. Turning around and away from Kagaya, or the copy that I thought was her, I started to run towards the doors that were meant to lead me out of that nightmare. Since dreams like this work through metaphors and other BS stuff in this show, I had to hope I wasn't wrong as I felt bolting towards my only way out. The fact I was really managing to get through that was enough to confirm a thought of mine about this bizarre situation. It had to be an illusion, a trickery of my imagination to get my poor butt off from being too hasty and rushing through the process that was training. I was in a comfy situation, but I knew well enough that neither being a lazy butt or being too invested in the work was going to help me in the long run. So I had to balance that from now on and hope this was all a metaphor for that. Much to my eternal disappointment, I was quickly brought to an unpleasant defeat when I felt my chances of being spared by a terrifying jump scare being crushed the moment I reached the doors when I felt a sudden gust of wind hitting part of my back as I finally found myself alone with her. Kagaya merely stared, yet her height was more than enough to get me even more nervous about the situation as I reached out for the doors and open to nothing in there. My jaws dropped at the pure darkness that existed all around this unknown location. I was stuck with this faux Kagaya for some inexplicable reason, and I had no way out of this as far as I could tell. Turning to address the woman, I tried to make sense of the predicament and think how to handle this unpleasant circumstance. This had to be fake. There was no way possible within the natural and anime laws of this world that this was the real one. I wouldn't have believed otherwise, and yet here I was staring at something as sinister as the mother of the two sages and the host of the Juby. She was only staring at me, studying me as I carefully waited for something good to happen. To perhaps be blessed either with an exit or through my mind ending the copy and bring me out of my state of unconsciousness. 
yet I could only look at her as she attentively eyed me to see me do something more than just looking back at her. A blink, that was all Kagaya needed for her to fly towards me with a terrifying speed. Dread rising up at the bad development, I tried to do the most sensible of the things I could have done in that moment by starting to prepare a fireball technique to try and defuse this new issue. It was meant to delay my opponent, to give me the chance to last longer than a couple of minutes. I knew well enough that if Kagaya could shrug off full power Naruto during the last fight, and I wasn't expecting for my attack to do much more than annoy the dangerous being that was going to eventually kill anyone against her and enslave the rest. The fire exploding from my lips soared furiously towards the approaching silver-haired woman, only to have her dodge the attack instead of blocking or deflecting it away. Could it be that the woman was actually weaker in this domain? If this was my head, I knew that she wasn't going to have much to use against me considering how this was all a dream and why was I having this much trouble banishing this nightmare? Why I felt this being far more real than I was painting it to be. There was no way this was something more than an illusion, especially with how she had yet to advance and kill me at once. As if she could read my mind, Kagaya resumed her assault without saying a single word. Her expression still stuck in one of fascination, and one devoid of any seriousness on what was happening in that moment. For some reason, I felt like I was a mouse being belittled and played around by a silent mad scientist. Instead of relying on the fireball technique again, I decided to try something a little more risky by going underground to try and get some element of surprise as she zeroed the distance between us. I ended up moving below her capacity to strike just in time to dodge her, giving me plenty of time to return above behind her and unleash my fire-based attack behind her back. I pushed myself up, getting a full sight over the woman before delivering a second fireball directly aimed at her upper back but she didn't dodge this time around. In fact, she didn't even put much effort as her hair sharpened and took the brunt of the attack without restraint. My jaws dropped as her silvery hair managed to live through the fiery onslaught, but after doing so the tendrils traveled quickly towards me. After quickly reaching for two of my kanais, I started to cut around in an effort to be spared by these swift hair locks. But while I did have some early success against it, I saw my progress denied when a couple of those finally managed to wrap around my legs and pull me closer to Kagaya as the woman had my face close to hers for a little while. Her white eyes stared at me intensely, and I could now see the degree of curiosity that had driven her to be this interested in me. She leaned closer, her lips turning up as she planted a kiss on my forehead. The action was more than enough to have me stop struggling, my mind going blank as I was caught off guard by such action. Why was she doing this? Why? What was going on here? My brain burned even more after that chaste kiss only a mother knew how to deliver to a child, but my panic exploded in a new fit of struggling against my limitations as I was being pulled away from the safety of a stable room in the middle of nothingness, and right through the doors that led into the dark void surrounding this large room. She gave me one last stare before nodding and throwing me out of there. It was in that moment that I actually started to scream. The sensation of plummeting to my own demise was far too real for this to be a mere dream, and another round of confusion started to completely leave me stomped about this matter as I couldn't do much but allow myself to fall into oblivion. Not. Mine. My eyes opened to a familiar ceiling as I was finally pulled out of my dream. This wasn't, the Hokage Manor, no. I could recognize from the fact I had woken up inside my room and in my bed. I was still wearing my usual clothes, but I had been tuckered up to be sleeping under my sheets. My confusion could only grow in these circumstances, and when I found my mother bolting towards me after peeking to check if I was awake or not, I was given some more insight on what happened while I was unconscious. As Mito saw me collapse on the floor, she panicked, and by panicking the woman ended up ordering a couple of healers to come to her home to check on my conditions before sending me back home. Somehow I had managed to stress myself to a point where I was unable to keep up with the mental strain created by my rushed approach over ceiling. I could have taken a safer approach, but at the same time I was too invested on the topic to genuinely stop and worry about such a thing. 
I would have paid attention to this cumbersome problem from now on, and I had to promise my mother that I wasn't going to get too fast in trying to learn Fuinjutsu. It was an unpleasant decision, but I decided to uphold it considering how that mere session managed to get me to face something. Something I myself wasn't sure what it was and what it wanted, nor how it ended to materialize in my mind and why it is me being the one that has to now deal with this new circumstances. And with the fact that I would have to spare a full day from action, I had made plans to try to study what had exactly happened and what the words really meant in these circumstances. If only I knew at the time that the next months were going to be a pain in the butt, then I would have paid extra attention to what was soon to come. Chapter 10, I'll Make One You know, life is never that difficult when you know how to make an honest gaining from an absurdly easy job. Now, one would easily mistake this claim to be somehow related to being a shinobi and doing missions, but the thing that many really failed to consider when it came to this kind of economy was how simple it was to gain the greatest weapon available in this time period. At least, that is until someone, which is me, decides to use this reasoning to explain to a confused Haruzen why my wallet was always full and fat with cold cash. To someone from a renowned clan, that much money wasn't rare to see someone handling, but considering the brunette's age, I quickly realized the problem was more about me being the one having this much pocket change at my disposal. Add to the matter that the Shimura clan shouldn't have a stable income from work since mother was retired and had little qualification to try for some meaningful job. The reason why we were able to live as well as we could was because the house was a gift from the Hokage to the clan and because my father had plenty of riches left for us to use to sustain ourselves. I could bring up theories about how it was possible for that much coin being able to sustain the original Shimura family, but I was fairly certain that, after the eventual death of the original Miss Shimura, Danzu was somehow supported by Hashirama for a certain time period. Just enough for him to graduate and make a living through missions. It would also explain his devotion to completing the mission, with each check matching in his general survival within the village. Still, he wasn't the protagonist of this brilliant and insanely stupid tale about how I managed to get a stable source of money flowing right in my clan coffers. It all started with a small question that roused when I found a specific aspect of chakra control training I hadn't realized even existed. When I asked Madara about this technique, the man didn't give it much weight, merely saying that it was simple to accomplish the feat depicted by the book. I decided to try out the moment I was back home from that training session, picking a small plot of land that was still within our private property and decided to test my theories on the field. Two days later, I presented my mother two fat bags filled with coins and an idea she was difficult to rope into until I gave her proper sight over the procedure I had elaborated. Chakra wasn't a science known to the fullest, especially with how the chaotic period of the warring states drove a full shift of its usage to battle-related abilities. What many didn't know, or at least weren't still able to grasp after almost a century or two of fighting, is that chakra could be used for other kinds of work. In this particular case, I was aiming at agriculture itself. Vegetables are the main source of food after long conflicts. People just know that eating anything luxurious during trying times was synonym of begging for some serious riots or assassination. May it be grain or rice, food born from the fertile soils was regarded as the main source of nourishment for most of the planet's population. In basic economics, better equipment translates in higher quality for the products elaborated through standard processes. With current farmers having trouble keeping up with the changing times, the production of available rice is dampened by this issue, and the moment someone manages to get a steady and big amount of food for people to buy through proper stores, then this individual is going to be able to exert a monopoly on the product. They gain momentum the more they work through the process, until someone else arrives with a better procedure to get more products out of the previous process. So when I realized I could use chakra to speed up the growth of plants without having Mokutan as part of my affinities, I decided to give it a go and see how far I could go before actually tiring myself out. The result was that I ended up furnishing the local food store with at least a hundred rice cups in the first attempt to get this done. I was baffled, shocked by the fact that nobody actually came up with this idea and 
I knew I had to do something rather ballsy but incredibly difficult to get through with if lacking my mother's own permission to go ahead with this. The Shemur clan lacked any family-owned abilities, but just like any clans lacking this kind of unique traits, they could develop some artificial ones to keep up with the other clans. To avoid this little trick to fall into unwanted hands, I decided it was only correct for my part to have this sealed as a family-only secret. The Hokage was confused by the decision, but it was Mito herself that made him realize the cunning plan I had just discovered. I wasn't sure if Hashirama considered it a flattering discovery since this very secret was loosely tied to the Senju's Mokutan, or if he was just surprised none of his clan actually came up with this idea about this. Maybe they came up with it, but with the warring state this idea was just lost in the endless period of conflict that preceded Kanoha's foundation. Finally, after three weeks of making tall numbers with the production of rice, I decided that the next step had to be carefully decided. I couldn't keep up on my own with the demand, and I knew that trying to grasp at the coins I had for too long was going to create only economic problems for my family and the village itself. Without proper economic rules keeping the entire settlement to collapse onto itself, I had to take a bigger step than the one I would have wanted to go for. It started as a minor attempt, with me trying my hand persuading some of the farmers living beyond the main gates of Kanoha. The farmlands were protected only by the outer wall which was supposed to confirm the borders of the village, but even now there was little case of banditry with the intense patrolling missions issued by the Hokage himself. Reaching out from one of the few candidates that would have been open to an economic deal, I was allowed to buy a share of its gains at the expense of investing on the plot of land and improving it to be used at its maximum potential. To the eyes of the old farmer owning that section of the territory, it just felt like a divine blessing. And I couldn't exactly blame him for bowing at me as if I was the avatar of some god of agriculture when I managed to produce in a single day twenty times the rice he would be able to produce in a full week. At first he thought that there was some trickery afoot when I said I wasn't going to be the one to personally oversee this kind of process, but he seemed to change his mind when I presented him to the worker I had decided to hire for this task. Noda Bunjiro was an old shinobi that had retired a little less than two years ago. After his left I was damaged in one of the last fight of the Warring States era, the man had been given an honorable discharge for his loyalty to the Senju clan and was given the chance to live the rest of his life in complete peace and enjoy a substantial pension to pay for any expenses until the end of his existence. Of course the old man that had fought endless battles wouldn't just give up the chance to actually do something with his skills instead of bemoaning the lack of action after retiring. While one thing was being spared from the horrors of war, another was putting someone that could still do so much with his abilities to a forced retirement. So when I gave him the chance of working with me with contracts and seals to prevent him from turning on me with the secret skill I wanted to give him for this kind of job, he jumped the boat as if I had offered him a lifelong membership to a quality brothel. Bunjiro was the first of many veterans that were itching to do something more than spending their days sitting there but in their living rooms and only muse about their glory days. And as many veterans, there were various farmers that were open for that kind of deal. In less than two months, I ended up conquering more than 70% of the farmlands that were under Kanoa's jurisdiction. In less than two months, the price of food decreased to best regulate the sudden increase of availability for both rice and other vegetables in the local markets. To summarize it all, the Uchiha and the Hyuga might have pretty eyes, and the Senju had their Mokutan but the Shimura clan held control over a non-negligible portion of Kanola's food source, and this was going to only go better for the clan once I managed to convince through negotiations the rest of the farmers to join my little scheme. I could still remember the tears of Joy Mom was shedding when I took her for a big shopping spree. When I told her that she could buy what clothes she wanted no matter the price, she fell on her knees and forced me in a tight embrace. And that, Hiruzen Kuen, is how babies are made. As I concluded my explanation with that, the brunette seemed to snap out of his unfocused state of mind as his poor head was having some trouble digesting some steps of my brilliant plan and, now I did say something interesting that caught his attention at once. W what? Babies? But we were talking about Dash. I was talking about why I got this rich at first, but then when I saw you all confused and thinking, 
I tried to check if you were still listening to me by adding the truth behind how babies are made at the end of it. His jaws dropped and his cheeks flushed at that mirthful response. Are really? Nope, I cheekily answered, gaining a quick frown from him. As if I would know how that madness works, Haruzen Kuen. I prefer to keep myself pure and untainted. He seemed to buy it, but he looked immensely pissed by having tricked him through that joke. I had thought about doing that to him, but I decided against it. I had my standards, and my standards lied about the extreme barriers imposed by human morality itself. Do you want to buy some ice cream? The brunette frowned at me and I shrugged. I'm paying. That seemed to get him to concede to that request, nodding in agreement as we decided to go for a detour to pick some of that sweet treat. Ah, isn't it great to have knowledge of modern economy in a world where economy was an untreated subject? Chapter 11, Omake 2 Maniko Shimura is what many would consider a lovely flower that was slightly hurt by the unfairness of time itself. Losing her husband and father-in-law almost at the same time took a toll on the poor woman's mind and self-esteem. A lady that was only learned in housewifery, the woman was still devoted in her role as a single mother to a young shinobi in training. Madara knew just this much when he tried to scavenge for any information about the woman he was currently aiming to make his, and that left him as perplexed as further intrigued. Sure, he had expected to find little expansion to what he already had on the fair lady, but to actually find nothing beyond what he was aware about through her son was enough to urge him to grow more fascinated at the sense of mystery behind her figure. She wasn't the most gorgeous, and he had many other women that were more beautiful than her, but it would be a lie to say that she didn't hold a brilliant sense of natural prettiness that made him look at her with interest beyond the mere curiosity. She was a lovely sight, and one that had shown no interest in him despite the fact her son was studying under him. Many women would have killed to be in that situation, and yet Miniko merely thought of him as a respected head of clan and her child sensei. Nothing more. Something about that degree of respectful distance made the Uchiha lament the fact that she wasn't interested in him beyond that. It felt like a slap, but not one to be genuinely offended as. More like a wake-up call that maybe, just maybe some women didn't want to have him as a husband to be set for life. That idea was absurd for him to even consider. For years he had been troubled with requests of arranged marriage. Even his younger brother wasn't spared by the onslaught of ladies wanting to become part of their clan through them and it just left them dejected from any chances of having a proper family born through something like love or affection. And yet, as he looked at his apprentice and his lone mother, he couldn't help but feel quite certain about it. That woman was a rare opportunity that was just waiting for him to be taken away from that lonely homestead. Yes, he could now see how that could be only good for everyone if he at least tried to rescue her from that. Oh, Achiha-san. I wasn't expecting you to visit, the woman greeted quietly, having just now opened the door to her home to him. Danza Kuen is currently spending some time with Haruzen Kuen, but he should be back in an hour or so. Shimura-san, he calmly greeted back. I was actually planning for a visit of courtesy. I had no scheduled session with your son. Her eyes widened in surprise. Is that so? I guess I was just not expecting for you to be free for this kind of activity, Achiha-san. Free for this? Well, being the clan leader can leave a person quite busy, the kind lady answered. Ikaku intends to be rather taken by the paperwork when. I'm sorry, I didn't dash. It's all right, Madara conceded, surprised by that sudden remembrance from the woman. He could see her flinch at the memory, the pleasantness of that bit of the past tainted by the mourning for her losses. I hope I'm not intruding. You are not, Miniko confirmed with a smile. But I was a little busy with the kitchen, I can take a break if it's important. It's not needed. I will follow you there and allow you to keep on with your activities. She nodded, almost grateful. Thank you, Achiha-san. His lips twitched in minor discomfort at that response. It just felt odd for someone to be relieved to resume their chores. 
Maybe it was something ingrained in her mind and going through that duty was an important bit of her day. Following the woman around the house, eventually they arrived at their destination, and Madara took a seat by the nearby table as he regarded the half-distracted widow with a curious look. How should he start making a conversation right now? It was easy to greet and make some brief discussion out of the previous exchange of words, but right now he was having trouble coming up with a good opener for a proper talk. It was the first time in many years that he was failing in thinking about a proper way to begin a conversation, and this wasn't even in the middle of the battlefield. It should have been easier and, yet it wasn't. So, I guess it has to be quite lonely without your son around, he started, trying to make a foothold by bringing a winning subject up. The woman hummed, glancing at him briefly but giving him a simple nod. Sometimes. I admit that it can be quite tiresome to have this big house and not many people housing it. Madara wanted to face Palm for having indirectly brought her back to think about her deceased husband. He needed to salvage the situation now. I've heard Mito has been visiting quite often. Same for Saratobi-san's wife. They do once in a while. Those are quite interesting experiences, she admitted especially those with Lady Hokage. I, I can understand, the Uchiha had to admit. Mito just wasn't the normal guest with her direct approaches. It wasn't overly annoying, but still it made for some wacky predicaments to be part of when she is around. Hmm, I suppose it can be quite tough, Miniko agreed quietly. I've seen the Hokage's brother being rather unhappy with your family, Uchiha-san. The fool is just trying to undermine my clan's position. He thinks only the Senju should be regarded as the founders of the village. That's silly, the woman commented with a nod. In fact, I believe the Hokage had reprimanded him on multiple occasions for that. Really? Madara was actually surprised by this discovery. Sure, he knew Hashirama would always confirm that it was a combined effort that created Kanoha, but the man never had the chance to check if his rival was of the same mindset when discussing these matters with others. And how do you know of this, Shimura-san? Well, Maniko paused, allowing a tiny hint of red to stain her cheeks. It was something Mito-san complained about during our last visits. She said that Tobarama-san can be rather childish about this matter, but that his brother would always bring him back to a calm understanding dot. Sparring? That would explain why that thorn on his side was rather subdued with his frustrations over the Uchiha clan. Still, that made him even more curious and he was actually allowing the woman to direct his attention away from the main reason that saw him there today. Taking a calm pause to recollect his thoughts, Madara knew he now had to be a little more direct with his comments. Lest he was going to be led astray once again from that topic. Shimura san May I ask about your son? Danzakuin? Is there something he did? Considering how much he had done in the last few months, yes. But since all of those were already known to the woman, he decided to calm her with a calm sigh. As far as I know, he has yet to do something interesting, he guaranteed. But the reason why I'm bringing him up is... I can't help but think he has to be quite a handful at times. He is a young boy. He is meant to be quirky at this time of his life, and I know I will only regret the time these amusing instances go lost in his growth to maturity. Don't you fear that he might grow even more bizarre now? I don't wish to undermine your care, but don't you believe the fact he only has his mother will influence his growth? No. He frowned. That sounds quite swift, Shimura san. Let's just say that I don't share your same worries, Achiya-san, Miniko calmly elaborated. In fact, I believe Danzakuin has a responsible father figure already looking out for him. His frown deepened. Did he miss anyone approaching his students while he wasn't training him? Maybe at the academy, no, it had to be the Hyuga. Who? The woman actually giggled at the question, stopping with her task to fully address him with that simple answer. Why, I was referring to you, his sensei. Oh. Oh, right. 
He was his sensei. That felt rather awkward to digest. I suppose, that's true. He talks a lot about you, the widow added. He might try to sound tough at times, but my boy is still someone that can't lie when he is speaking of someone that he admires and respect. That actually was nice to hear. Even though it wasn't why he came here, that development sure had him satisfied. Instead of lingering any further, the man decided it was just about time to leave instead of keeping on trying to get something a little more meaningful out of this interaction. He had already made much progress than previous times, and he knew the only times he could get something done was when his student was out of the house. After mentioning this to the widow, he was quietly escorted back to the entrance of the compound, where he shared a few last words with the woman before leaving. I suppose I shall see you soon, Achiha San Dash. Madara. Uh, I believe it is fitting if we addressed each other's name. I've been spending dinners at your home for a while. Miniko San. It's only proper if we mutually accept this change in our formality. Was he asking too much? Maybe. Just maybe. I, I suppose I mean, if it's not asking too much since your dash. I was the one asking, Miniko San. You just have to either accept or decline this proposal. T then I accept. He nodded, almost cracking a smile at the fact he finally got her flustered like that. It wasn't the best he could have hoped for, but it was still something that made this entire trip and the ensuing conversation worth making. Soon he was on his merry way back home, completely ignoring the fact that as he was leaving, a certain boy had spotted his sensei walking out of his house with a happy smile. A week filled with pranks would then ensue, but Madara, despite the irritation at the brat's stubborn defense, couldn't help but still grin at the memory of how gorgeous Maniko looked when then embarrassed. Chapter 12 Rocky Front What's the best way to celebrate eight years of age in a world where peace is more of a synonym to temporary armistices? Why, if it isn't war itself? Now, I'm sure many would be shocked to hear this kind of reaction when I was finally enlisted in the Shinobi Corps. Differently from what I had expected, the academy lasted way less than I had imagined. I blamed the fact the education system was just not up to sustain classes of new recruits from beyond a couple of years. I was among the lucky kids that were already facing graduation at the end of the first year and I passed. I was surprised that the test had been that simple to ace, but I was equally surprised when I realized that the only ones passing beyond me were Haruzen, a couple of Uchiha kids and some Sinjus. I would have expected some others to pass, but I was shaken to learn the level of understanding the classmates had for the test just was inadequate. I blamed the early state of education itself for this kind of awkward graduation. Yoshiko was actually mad for a few days when she learned that the Hokage had seen fit to set the age of enlistment to seven, making her bid to join the corps early on crumble before her eyes. Don't worry, Shiko-chan. You will certainly see the flames of war by the time it's your turn to join the mad party. I believe it's time for a little history in warfare, mostly one about the kind of standoff I had been thrown into with other children my age. While a formal declaration had yet to be issued, Iwaga Kure decided to start some harassment operations aimed to undermine Kanoa's stability. With merchants being bribed to shift their destinations away from our village and a sudden increase of bandits leading to new worries about the farms beyond the village's wall, the only proper answer to this was a mobilization meant to repel any suspicious attempt to destabilize home. Mother was pissed, so was Madara in a minor part. My sensei wasn't that frustrated that I had to go to war when things were going to escalate, but he was genuinely worried that by delaying the inevitable for too long Hashirama was leaving us vulnerable to a major assault. I shared that concern, but I was at ease considering that Mito had just mentioned that some special defenses were planned to be set up to counter any sneaky attack. Seals were scary things and, after what happened the first time I tried using those. After a full week of declining continuing with these lessons, I eventually tried again out of curiosity. I didn't get any nightmare with those, but I did suffer some drain on my chakra reserves as I was swiftly put to go through numerous seals at once. 
I was far from being able to use those in battles since I wasn't fast enough to draw anything under duress, and I had yet to get the proper kanji to get the Thunder God Jutsu down to use at my leisure. Small steps, I thought at the time, and I had other things to worry about. Mostly about new techniques, this time based around my wind affinity. Once I had Vacuum Sphere and Vacuum Great Sphere, I decided to test my hands in getting great breakthrough. These were three techniques that were meant to help immensely during a battle, with the first two being single unit degree abilities, while the third was an AoE attack if aimed properly. I had basic knowledge of how to make storage seals and I had heightened my resistance to illusions. Yep, I was ready to go and fight this war like a big boy. The first day was pretty calm. I knew I wasn't going to see action early on. Not just because of my young age that would make many commandants uneasy of sending me to dangerous missions, but because I was a new recruit. And what do new recruits do on their first day at work? They understand the basics and get teased a fairly lot. Hee hee Dankuin, you shouldn't run alone. You might trip and get hurt, one of the Kunoichis in the patrol group commented, the others soon followed by giggling like frigging schoolgirls while I really was trying to do my job properly. Holding a great bag filled with medical tools and ointments, I was the assistant to the medic of the team. The man was somewhat sympathetic, but didn't say much beyond grunting yes or no. I pondered about the chances of this guy being an Uchiha, but I decided he was just the silent guy of the group. Thank Kamichama I'm not stuck with a conversationalist. I really needed these early days quiet to settle in my soul as I braced for Murphy's efforts of pulling an Obi-Wan on my General Grievous. I just knew simple patrols around with nothing more to fear than getting sneak cuddled by one of those perverts were quickly going to end when IWA began making bolder moves. Two days later, I felt the need of patting my own head for being a smart cookie. Sadly, that very amusing attempt was curbed the very moment I grimaced over how things came crashing down. Walking in the woods near to Kanoa's borders wasn't a novelty for someone like me, but with my unit getting pinned down as a squad of IWA ninjas decided to finally attack someone I knew I had to be a touch more serious than usual. Big rocks were being hurled at us, swiftly taking the attention of the team's heavy hitters as they tried to return stone with fire and wind. The replies seemed to be particularly effective as two bastards went down for being away from any cover. The advantage evened out when the medic was struck with a kunai right onto his forehead. I blinked, surprised to see the guy dying in front of me and... I started to move. I would have expected panic to explode at this sight and for me to freeze up at the gore. But then I realized that despite how horrifying the scene unfolding before me, that I had some preparations before that day. Was I unfazed by it? I was shaken, just not enough to stop and ponder over death itself, only to become an easy target to our enemies. Instead, I swiftly moved to retrieve the second pouch filled with medical equipment and started checking on the other's conditions. One of the Kunoichis had been wounded, with two kanais having embedded onto her right leg. While she tried to say that I had to leave that task to my boss, she seemed to go silent when I flatly said that he was dead and that she needed to let me do my job. Patching her leg was easier than I expected. After retrieving the weapons out of her flesh, I swiftly applied some water to clean the injuries and then some bandages imbued with the proper medical ointment. She merely nodded thankfully, for the first time since I've been annoyed by these women being more than happy to offer a sympathetic smile before moving on the next injured ninja. One of the heavy hitters was struck with one of the boulders. The painful crunchy noise coming from his left arm getting struck by the big projectile and bent in an unpleasant manner drew my attention to him as I bolted to his position. D damn it, they got some good aim. I nodded silently, swiftly cutting the sleeve and revealing the full extent of the damage as the man descended to sit down so I could treat him. One thing was fixing a cut, another was trying to mend an issue like the one I had in front of me. The limb was growing purple, and I needed to act quickly and with precision if the guy didn't want to go home early this year without an arm. I'd been reading the medical textbook given to me by the now-dead medic, but two days hardly had me prepared to go beyond fixing wounds. 
I was going through uncharted territory and I needed to pull a brilliant miracle lest this man actually died. As I started to move to start the procedure, I found myself stopped as the man reached for my arm, forcing me to look at his face. See, can you fix it? Can I, can I lie to him? Would it work? I could already see he was growing disillusioned at the chances of this being the case and I had to try my best on this. I will, I replied with a confident tone, my hands already trying to remember how to make use of medical chakra. It wasn't just something that was properly explained and I had to go blind about it if I wanted to actually get something done. Jesus Christ, why has nobody thought about expanding the knowledge of medical arts now that we are at peace? This was something I had to bring up to the Hokage the very moment I had the chance to speak with him. I really didn't want to be embarrassed like this next time. Because yes, it was just embarrassment. The chakra forming in my hands, initially blue as normally is, slowly turned green as I focused my control over it and molded it the way I wanted it to be. The process was theoretically simple since I knew what I wanted out of that procedure. First I needed to numb his limb. My chakra swiftly started to grasp over his own, lessening the sensibility of the nerves just enough to dull the pain. Next was bringing the limb to its correct position, and the snap that ensued got a quick jolt out of me as it worked swiftly enough to not even get a flinch out of the patient. Finally, using my chakra to bolster his healing factor and solve the swollen part. The moment I was done and the man's arm looked as normal as it should be, I let go and fell on my butt. My breathing was heavy and my reserves were definitely drained from that experience. The skirmish lasted a little longer, but the healed heavy hitter couldn't do anything since his arm was sore and the chakra in it had yet to flow correctly in it. Still, the battle concluded in our favor, with most of the attacking force killed and two three fools retreating away at the unpleasant odds that were stacked against them. We waited in, we allowed the quiet to settle down once more. Once we were all certain that they were gone, we started to check to see the extent of the losses. Other than the medic, one of the girls had died. It wasn't something I could have prevented, especially with the cause of death being a kunai through her left eye and into her brain. Storage scrolls were made to recover the bodies, and we were about to make our return back to the headquarters when we saw a massive fireball explode towards the sky. An alarm from another patrol group, the attack wasn't just against us. The squad advanced speedily, and at first I was bracing for the next fight as I knew our enemy wasn't playing around with their chances of winning this border war. But just as we were close to aid the other patrol group, I heard something rustle nearby. Turning instinctively towards the noise, I saw three individuals wearing IWA shinobi uniforms darting away as their leader held a struggling child over his shoulder. I gave a brief look over the kid's clothes and saw a familiar white-red fan. Achiha, wait, is that Kagami? Fuck, I forgot how villages used to try and kidnap kids from other clans during fights back in the first two wars. Gritting my teeth I paused and bolted to pursue the trio of jerks trying to go through with that kidnapping. I think I heard some of my team shout at me as I rushed away from the formation, but none gave chase as I aimed my attention to the IWA ninjas. Dear Kamichama, why do I have to be an insufferable rogue for the sake of my friends? Adrenaline is a monstrous thing when one is really pumping large quantities of it in their body. I was completely tired, but still running and working to the best as my mind was geared on the simple task of stopping the three kidnappers to go through with their attempt. I was slowly closing up to them from behind, my hands already fishing two shurikens from my pouches as I prepared to take down the guards first. I threw the weapons once I knew I was close enough and my range was clear of any possible obstacles. The shinobi on the left died with the blade of the projectile stabbing deep on the back of his head, while the second tool of death ended up slamming on the trunk of wood beside my next target, alerting the burly man of my presence. Another brat? He asked, surprised, his wide eyes turning to see his fallen comrade. You kill Dash. Shut up, I muttered quietly, as I assaulted him, kunai in my hands as I plunged it deep in his stomach, turning in, pushing him off the tree branch. 
Surprise and pain paralyzed the man as he fell to his doom while I resumed the chase. The last bastard had gained some distance with that delay, and I was pushing my legs to the limit in an effort to catch up to him. I was growing desperate as I knew I was going too deep into Iwa's territory and I needed to neutralize this threat before fellow border guards took notice of my presence. But it wasn't me that brought an end to that pursuit. I was surprised when I saw the guy's body going tense and then limp, tripping down to the ground in a shaken form as I took the opportunity to recover the fellow young ninja. Back on the ground, I pushed the big man off the terrified kid. I stared down in. You're not Kagami, I mentioned distractedly as his eyes turned to glance at me in pure terror and shock. But you got some pretty eyes for certain. The Sharingan returned my glance with two tomo already. That had to have been a massive fright to get the kid to develop this far on the whole hate eyes thingy. I offered a hand, and the boy pulled himself up slowly as we both stared at each other. T thank you. Oh, a respectful Uchiha. What are the odds? You're welcome in, we should probably leave. A nod, we were both moving back towards Kanoha's border as quickly as our legs allowed us to. The tree branches were creaking under our weight, and I was surprised when the kid decided to stick close to me during our return as I had expected him to get some distance between us the very moment we started our retreat. Ignoring this curious detail, I was hopeful for things to be fine once we were back to our allies. I mean, that was the plan before the trees we were using to move through the forest were taken down by a massive boulder rolling them to the ground. We both jumped away in time before we could have gotten dragged to an unfunny death and I paused for a moment as I found a stable branch where to stop and look at the one behind that sneaky attack. Shimura Danzu, I shall be your opponent. For fuck's sake, I'm not really in the mood for this. I looked down, I stared at the prick that formally demanded this fight and... I frowned when I recognized his ugly mug from somewhere else. I stared lengthily and I had to nod at my certainty on this matter. Yep, that's Anoki. He looked to be a young teen. About 1415 by the looks of it. You know, it's kind of rude yelling things like that without an introduction, I dryly pointed out. Also, running low on energies. There is a war around us. My name is Anoki, and despite the fact I would have preferred to fight you at your full power, I have to go through with my duties, the guy mentioned. Prepare yourself. Oh, I sure was prepared for him. I took just a moment to remember if he already could mold elemental chakra to create lava release and dust release. Both were big no-no to fight in any circumstances. Considering the odds of that being possible, I knew that he still had to get to that point. Limiting his might to his incredible mastery of earth release. Proof of that became apparent when I saw a terrifying piece of rock being thrown at us. The size of that thing was enough to erase the upper bit of the two trees we were standing on and, yet that wasn't really bad news since I had the perfect counter to this. Only issue? I was going to collapse once I made use of that since I was running out of juice. Sighing, I glanced at my peer with a serious look. I've a distraction in mind, but you need to get us out of there at once. My body is going to be unable to move once I'm done with the counter. There was a silent surprise coming from the guy and he nodded. Really stunned, wasn't he? Either that or he was natural with the Uchiha's silent gestures. Once I got that confirmation, I swiftly moved with my hand seals to get ready to stop the stone at once. The vacuum great sphere was a large sphere of compressed air. I was shooting the equivalent of an airsoft cannon-sized gun through my mouth. The result of the Birank Jutsu clashing onto the boulder was instantaneous as the big rock cracked and was turned into fine dust, effectively obscuring the sight of my opponent while the unknown Uchiha moved in to get me out of there. Sharingan still active, the kid bolted at an impressive skill the very moment my body tensed up and was about to fall backward. Being this close to him, I started noticing a couple of odd details I hadn't seen before now. A small ponytail, his frame was way slender than what Kagami had going in, his heavy breathing had a lighter pitch compared to boys. Nah, I was being too silly about this. 
I knew well enough that some kids could just be androgynous when it came to gender-based details, Haku being the primary example of that kind of issue. And even if I had some suspicions, I knew that we couldn't just stop to have a pleasant conversation about why I was having doubts about some things regarding my rescue slash savior. So I merely watched behind us to see if the young Inoki was giving pursuit or not. Much to my relief, I could see him no longer and I knew we were closing into the border to actually be bothered by any other IWA soldier. The only issues becoming the clumsy actions of my hero since I ended up slamming my head on a trunk a few times. Not hard enough to give me a concussion or anything grave, but it still hurt nonetheless. Eventually we arrived back inside the border and the first thing we noticed was a large common grave filled with numerous corpses that were once IWA troops. Some of the guards paused to greet us and we were soon taken to the closest commander in the area. Ten minutes later, I had some trouble staring up at Madara and his unflinching eyes as they tried to assert annoyance over my current conditions. I was sitting on the chair, a pack of ice resting on my forehead as I tried to get my fever down while dealing with the few bruises I got from the retreat. The other kid, the one I had rescued and that rescued me in return? He wasn't faring any better as he tried to genuinely stand up to his clan leader's stare and... What is your name, child? The kid sighed, and finally she spoke. Ryra, yes sir. Oh, so I was correct to assume I was dealing with a tomboy. Just not one of the tough kinds from what I could tell from the previous experience. I assume Shimura-san detached from his unit to try and free you from your captors, the man elaborated calmly. I've heard of an Uchiha being kidnapped Dash. I wish to apologize for having caused trouble, Madara-sama. He sighed. Are you saying that you normally can deal with three ninjas of considerable level at once? If you wish to apologize for something, it has to be something you know you could have done to prevent this event, Madara continued with a serious tone, his stare back at me much to my eternal grimace. Differently from you, Shimura-san should extend a formal apology to his superior since he had broken the lines without saying anything. Yeah, apologies I was feeling a little dizzy and... I thought Ryra-san was actually Kagami for a moment. And how does that reason explain that foolish decision of yours? I blinked, looking up at him and staring silently for a while. If Mio-san was kidnapped before your eyes and the Hokage wasn't around to save her, but you could, would you go ahead with it? His mouth opened, but he paused to show a confused look at the logic I was trying to pull out of that example. I would. I sighed. Why? Because it's a duty and the Hokage wouldn't be merciful if I failed to comply with it. Well, if Kagami or any of my friends was taken away against their will and I was the only one capable of quickly moving in, and I didn't, then I would be merciless when it comes to condemning myself for being a horrible person. A sigh left the man's lips and he turned to the girl with a tired look. I shall address your case tonight with your parents. Your superior has reported you have done flawless work in the field and this shall be rewarded accordingly to your merit. Surprise adorned Rara's face as she stood up from her chair and started to make her way to the door. She gave me a silent look and nodded my way. Why did I feel like she was expecting him to chew me up? Student of mine, I want a serious explanation of what happened in this rescue mission, he quickly said, eyes narrowing on me. All details. Killed two of the captors. Ryra was the one that killed the one that was holding her and her parents will be happy to learn she got two Tomo today. At eight? Not a proud accomplishment if it is tied to such a bloody situation. War might be one thing, but kidnapping can be quite troublesome to remember as a day of growth, Madara explained. Still, I can say it isn't everything. I found out that I have a one-sided rival in a Wavikur. I wonder if it's like having an admirer, but the guy just wants to only fight with me. I suppose you dealt with him. Low on reserves, I could only offer distraction for a run back to base, I replied quietly. Ryra is fairly strong. She managed to not drop me during our escape. As much as it frustrates me, I have to praise your conduct for today. 
while you did incur in a case of insubordination, your superior was lenient enough to spare any report to have you removed from the corps, he said, gaining a flinch out of me at that avoided outcome. Still, I've decided that you will issue a formal apology to him for having been a stupid and reckless brat. Your mother will be also told of this. You, you can't do this, Dash. I'm your leader, Shimura san he calmly addressed his lips, having some trouble in not letting out a giddy smile at my current suffering. It's only correct for your worried parent to be told of your antics. That was going to be a pain in the butt to handle. Is there anything else I have to do? Did you do anything worthy of punishment? I shrugged. I laid out what happened as it did, Dad. Nothing to add after that. I understand. Still, I hope you, wait, he paused and then he stood up from his chair. What did you say? Frowning, I tilted my head in confusion. What? What you just said. Repeat that. I. I laid out what happened as it did. A little after that. I opened my mouth as my brain tried to bring up what words I had used in that sentence in. Oh. Oh no. I am drained. Spare me some mercy, sensei. Your mind seems as sharp as it usually is, he rebuked, glancing at me with an odd look. Please, repeat that very word. Dad? Again. No, I believe I will not. He narrowed his eyes at me and I returned the stern stare with one of mine. I wasn't going to call him that. I was tired, and my brain just wasn't paying enough attention to the conversation to know what's best for my survival. I suppose you will require some rest. After what happened today, I've already sent a message to the Hokage to have the current guard replaced with more fresh troops. The ones that saw battle today shall all return to Kanoha for a full week for medical controls. And after that we go to war? For the first time ever, I saw Madara genuinely unhappy with how things had turned into. I just wasn't sure why he didn't like the fact we were at war once again. Still, he regarded my question with a curt answer. Yes. And I knew that now the real difficult part of my new life had begun. Chapter 13 Rocky Front A week of preparation could hardly get me in the mindset for a full-fledged war. Especially when this conflict was going to be decades long. I couldn't exactly remember how long the first war was, mostly because the timeline was crazy in canon, and I knew in this case this was going to be longer than that. Both first and second Hokages were going to die in it, and I was going to be a combatant on the leaf side from the very beginning. Maybe I was being overly paranoid since we now had Madara and I knew Hashirama wasn't going to waste so much of his life force through his sage form in normal skirmishes. If I knew something about how things were going to be, I just needed to keep an eye out for Anoki and his master. Maybe also any ancestors today Dara if they are as crazy as that guy. After having to deal with some serious lecturing from my new mother and the chiding from Mito herself about endangering myself so early on the war, I took the week to get my hands on more scrolls on offensive techniques and a proper medicine book and start making sense of what was known about current ninjutsus. The answer to that question I had while treating the wounded proved to be pretty disappointing since the role of medic mean seemed to have been established around the formation of the village. And since that meant I couldn't rely on much beyond my own knowledge that there were some good healing skills that needed to be invented, I felt prompted to take some initiative in making some advances about it on my own. Prolonged conflicts tend to be rather cruel to soldiers that couldn't afford having top-notch medics to prevent illnesses to spread all over the line. And since it was mostly confirmed that the First Shinobi War was supposed to be a recall to the Great War, well, shit. I had to make good contingencies to prevent any major outbreaks from ever happening no matter the part of the front I was operating it. So imagine my surprise when Madara himself saw it fit with assigning me in the most unlikely of teams for the sake of spiting me and leaving me with a challenge while I fought a goddamn conflict as a regular soldier. While I could forgive him for putting Ryra since I had the chance of meeting her before returning to the front as she wanted to apologize for putting me in danger with her recklessness and she ended up being an individual I could speak as if she was Haruzen or a more active Kagami, 
I saw it as a shot at my sanity when he decided to put in command of a certain arrogant prick. Man, I sure wasn't missing the times at the academy where Hiratata would try to harass me in an effort to prove himself the better shinobi, only to be scolded by the teacher and belittled by his fellow classmates. So now that he was being in the front lines, I expected him to be a little more serious on the problem that was IWA and less on trying to outmatch me at every turn. It was a good hope to have, one that sadly didn't get the chance to even fly off the ground that it was shredded by the cruel wind that is reality. We should be perching closer to the road, Hiratata lamented as I tried my best to not make him disappear in an accident. While Madara saw it hilarious to pair me with the self-centered prick, he was still serious enough to put our small team on a really simple task. We needed to keep an eye for any attempts from IWA to try and get some ninjas to sabotage the main force advance towards the principal battlefields on the border. Since Kanoha had a larger army than our enemies, the only way they could get victories out of this conflict was to delay the bigger chunks of our military and kill off the small groups they were capable of finding around. To slow down the mass mobilization, their best method was to ambush, make quick skirmishes to distract and stop the main advance, and put down explosives to tear apart some bits of our current force. It was a full-force guerrilla tactic that really worried me since, well, America lost against Vietnam. And I really didn't want to see the rocks roll without anyone moving them anytime soon. I was too young to start having some serious PTSD to be concerned about. We're close enough, I calmly answered. H.N. Yep, Kami Chama, this is the shit you have to put me for the next decade or so. Why art thou so cruel to thine servant? I gave a glance to Ryra, the girl sparing me a quick understanding look before we returned to gaze over the main road that could have been used to rush an attack to the main force's left flank. This was a plot of land that couldn't have been defended well in case we were attacked from any assaults coming from that road. So someone had to keep an eye open about it, disable any attempts to pass through, and sound the alarm the moment the attack couldn't be disabled through our own capacities. We were glorified scouts, but I didn't find it a terrible role to start this ugly war. It was only for the best I was put in a position where I hadn't to worry about getting killed by a stray kanai that I failed to notice because I was too distracted by the battle happening around me. Movements It's a carriage. Hiratata muttered, Byakugan in full display on his face and trained on the approaching vehicle. It would seem like our enemies were coming in just in time. Tensing up, I activated the seals I had placed on the road, deploying spikes that were meant to destroy any wooden tire rushing and trampling on those. Be ready, I muttered to the Echiha, Ryra starting to prepare her hand signs as I followed her pattern. The plan was to stop the carriage, burn the content of said merchant, and then kill the merchant himself if he managed to survive the cash. So when the vehicle arrived at the half-hidden spikes, we weren't much surprised when the tires shattered and forced the driver to be forcefully ejected forward to painfully roll on the ground. The girl released a fireball, while I fueled the size of the dangerous jutsu by a fair lot with a wind bullet. The air also increased its power and the speed of detonation, causing the entire cargo section of the carriage to explode in a glorious inferno. Limbs, heads, much blood those were all ejected as remains of the previously alive IWA ninjas. The driver's head had cracked open as the panicking shinobi failed to make the proper signs for the replacement or body flicker jutsus. We approached the result of that vicious combo and tried to find if there were any survivors needing some quick death. I doubted someone managed to live beyond that attack without reporting any damages to their bodies. Still, our search was a calm one, with Hiratana surprisingly keeping quiet during the task. He looked serious, focused and, less of a pain in the butt, and more of a reliable individual. Why the heck couldn't he be like that all the time? The lack of major reaction at the gore proved that this wasn't his first rodeo and, from what I could remember, the guy had passed the test to see the spark of the conflict we were currently handling. Surely he had the chance to either see death before, or even claim a life himself in some circumstances I was mostly unaware about. Still, during our search I noticed something off about the blood. It wasn't red, but rather, 
a soft shade of brown. It was mud. These were real people, I realized with dread coating my entire being. But before I had the chance to explain this to my teammates, we all tensed up as we felt sudden pressure forcing us to prepare for a sudden attack. That was an interesting way to dispose of the decoy. I started looking around for the origin of the voice, surprised that someone had thought so far in advance and had waited for us to come out. Gritting my teeth, I almost whispered our sensor to get his shiny eyes working, but the guy was already scanning around and looking particularly clueless despite the perfect vision he got of our surroundings. It was only moments later that I noticed that something was creating a shadow on us. And there was no cloud in the sky on this sunny day. So I looked up and I saw something really interesting and cool that I really wanted to learn. A flying mummy? I commented flatly, receiving a scowl by the dangerous bastard hovering us. I tried to keep my nerves steeled as I recognized the guy and the situation had just gone south by a fair lot. I was looking at the future second such a kid. I guess I should have expected a degree of immaturity from children, Mu lamented with a sigh. Still, I'm very intrigued by what I've seen. Truly a fine beginning of this test. W. Who are you? Hiratata half screamed and the man hummed. I shall be your opponent, he calmly replied. But this fight, it shan't be one considering our differences in potential. Danzu, do you know him? I nodded at Rara's question. That guy I believe Sensei said was the Tsuchikage's bodyguard when the Kages met. I see that you have kept track of all important information. A shinobi's main strength is knowledge, the no-person ninja praised. Still, knowledge is worthless without experience and power to make it powerful. I sighed, narrowing my eyes at the man as I tried to come up with a way to distract him so we could leave in peace. One thing I really didn't want to do today was dying to someone that was much stronger than me. Madara was deep in the first line, helping with the current clashes, so I couldn't exactly hope he would come by and save our butts. But just as I prepared to delay as much as possible to lower his guard, a pain in the butt himself had to speak up, feeling ignored by the deadly bastard one step away from killing us. My name is Hiratata Hyuga, and I shall be your opponent. Regrets, I had many. But none were coming close to the murderous state of mind I was slowly slipping in so I could put an end to this infuriating predicament. Even Ryra, which had been a saint considering how much of a thorn the brat had been to the two of us, was slowly getting livid at the stupid boast. So you believe you can just deflect my attacks? Are you so certain of it, boy? Mu was gloating. It was blatant, and yet the boy had to be a moron and reply with a stupid yes. It would take me little to reach out for his neck and twirl around until he stopped painting a target on our team's back. Okay, the mummy-like ninja shrugged before forming a big cube-like structure through his dust release. I groaned but I didn't linger for too long as I gave a simple and easy-to-understand order. There was no audio distraction, there was no reason to not follow it. Move out of the way! It was an easy command. Perhaps a little more complicated than stand by or sit, but still easier than some elaborated plan that could have gotten morons confused. And yet, despite how simple the sentence was, how legitimate my order was, Hiratana stood his ground and, he prepared to give his best to at least block the attack. The logic behind the eight trigrams palms revolving heaven is to create a thin self-sustaining barrier of chakra that was meant to deflect pretty much low to medium grade techniques. Maybe with some extra training, it could hold against a full-powered Rasengan, but right now the boy's jutsu was quite weak. It was a solid one, but far from being able to deflect dust release so I expected him to bail the moment the cube impacted on the small shield. It was common logic, like an iron glove moving to bitch slap a tiny bay blade, yet I was once again baffled when he tried to pull one of those I believe in myself moment, only to fail to realize that he was a prick, and he kind of didn't have any of an anime protagonist's plot armor. But you know what sucks the most? I was the chief in command of the foolish moron. Thus, by definition, 
I was still ordained to move in and help him out of that awkward position. So I bolted, ignoring common sense and taking a gamble and sweeping him out of the way by diving down below the shield as Heratata began to focus on just an area to try and stop the attack. Good news, I safely recovered the idiot. Bad news, my left leg wasn't lucky as the dust cube slammed down and bent that limb in a funny twist. It didn't break, but the crack and the early pain got me to recoil a moment at the unpleasant turn of events. Ah, the things I have to do to save my suicidal teammate. Why your leg? Why you why? I didn't reply since I only had foul words building up in an effort to reply to that. Thankfully my loyal Ryra was there to provide me some assistance, crouching down to check on me and providing me some distraction from Hiratana. Our Ryra, can you help me up? Mu was quietly observing the scene, his stare dully aimed right at me as I was supported in my efforts to stand up. My leg was fucked up, and I knew I would need to get it fixed as soon as we were away from this battle. Your companion failed. Eh, it happens to the best of us, I happily rebuked. By the way, what's the story of the bandages? Are you a clumsy man, Musan? Some say I can be quite deadly to everyone, even to myself. That sucks. I mean it. How about we have a talk and dash? Do you want to fight dying, boy? I prefer living and fighting. By the way, how is Anoki Kuin? He sighed. Annoying and impatient. I blame you for making him so insufferable. Apologies. I was down with my reserves and he was trying to be particularly vicious with our fair fight. Ah, fairness. Boy, do you know what's the difference between a samurai and a shinobi? One compensates for a lack of something with a bigger blade? The man almost choked at the innuendo, but he shook his head. A samurai fights by fairness and honor, Mu still replied. A shinobi is a killer that fights by tricks, ruthlessly exploiting his opponent's flaws and using those against them. Oh, well, that's a nice lesson. Sensei, can we continue tomorrow? I think my leg will get an infection if I get to stick around for long. Your comedy is indeed endearing. Sadly, I'm on a tight schedule myself. So, I either survive and die this one. Of course he would. Arira. I know this is a lot to ask. But don't bail on me, I requested, the girl giving me a wide-eyed stare and then offering me a determined nod. Yes. I smiled at her confidence, and I really felt blessed that two of the five good Uchihas were close friends of mine right now. Still, I narrowed my eyes as another cube formed in. I opened my right palm as I started to channel chakra. Dust release was awfully similar to how a raisin game worked. While this unique combo of natural affinities required a careful balance of earth, fire, and wind natures, the insane concentration needed to muster a proper form required a massive effort from the user. But what really made them different was that the Raisingan had a minor advantage over these multidimensional shapes of doom. It was small and it packed all its power in a reduced spot. Why was this important? The greater the surface, the least exerted the strength shall be in the form of pressure. Smaller surfaces with big power easily overwhelmed larger surfaces with big power behind them. The confrontation was vicious, with my arm trembling as I managed to slam the full raisin gun onto the cube. The cube tried to slap at me, but I was literally holding a meat grinder against it. The result was similar to what I had hoped for. The raisin gun had some trouble early on due to the fact I was standing still and the projectile was moving towards me and acquiring strength through velocity. Sadly for physics, I still held the mythical ball of energy that until fueled with my chakra wasn't going to lose to anything. So I pushed, and so did Ryra as we both were on to keeping our footing stable. I grinned as the structure collapsed, busting like a bubble before our eyes. I allowed the raisin gun to dissolve, my hand burning a little bit and so were my reserves in the effort of not letting us die by dust made Tetris. Moose stared, 
surprise piling up with frustration at the fact I regaled him with a quick birdie for the fact he put us in a deadly situation. Instead of saying anything, he just floated away in complete silence and quiet anger, and we all stared at his retreat. Shouldn't he be more interested in killing us? What the heck was that? Really odd for the guy to be this dismissive of a threat. Especially one that could handle his masterpiece so easily. Still. Fuck, I really want to learn the flying technique really bad. That was odd. I nodded in agreement as I sat down with Ryra by the nearest bonfire. The main army had managed to get through the unpleasant section that required our active duty, thus leaving us without a task and with the chance to rest for a little while. I was tired, the application of green chakra had lessened the swelling and allowed me to readjust the limb, while the use of warm water to clean up the wounded bits on its surface. I was still sore and I wasn't expected to walk any time soon. Hiratata was brooding in the distance, his eyes glaring the poor ground below his sandals as he tried to decide wherever he should be pissed in me saving his ass while heroically getting my leg horribly mutilated beyond salvation, until I, the glorious shinobi that I am, discovered the secret of hot water, or if he should accept a change of heart and be a good guy. I knew how things tended to work here, so I knew he would lean onto the latter than the former. It fits the narrative better since he got crap for being a huge prick. He, of course, wasn't going to change for the best overnight, and I expected him to pull a tough guy, maybe trying to make compromises to allow a form of rivalry to survive through this. And I fucking hate that part of my life. Sure, I love predicting anything serious before it happens, but one thing is to be aware of threats, another is to know I will still have to accommodate somehow the fact this guy was going to stick. If he doesn't somehow die. And that would still be sad. I really need to evaluate gardening again. I need something that can nullify my prediction capability. Maybe I could buy a plot from the farmers under my payroll and try my hand at that. Again. Hopefully with less fire this time around. Dan Zakuin. Familiar voice owned by Familiar Brunette. Hiruzen. Hiruzen Kuin. Good to see you, I replied with a greeting of my own. How was your mission? Did you bust an IWA neen or two? I got one. I helped Koharuchan get another while Hamirakuin got two with Sensei. I waved at the two shy and nervous teammates that made the original team Tobarama with Hiruzen as the second in command. I turned. Did you break your leg? Tobarama inquired with a seriously concerned tone. I frowned at that sudden question, caught off guard by that precise assumption and, then I noticed that I hadn't changed my torn pants with new ones. To treat the injury I had to use a kunai to cut through the cloth and give myself sight over the damage without pressuring the wound too much. No? I replied unconvincing. I just, wanted to, show my leg? I turned to Rara in an effort to gain support on this. The girl gave me a supportive nod and tried to come up with a non-awkward response. His leg is nice. I love the positive reinforcement, but I believe that comment wasn't going to sell my point properly with these intelligent beings. Those were far more capable than Hiratata, so I worried myself, rightfully so. You broke your leg, Hiruzen affirmed with a frustrated tone and I shrugged. I mean, maybe I just tapped it a little bit while sitting down dash. It was broken, the Senju confirmed as he crouched down and started to poke around the knee area, getting my leg to twitch and my face to let out a flinch at the sudden touching over the sore spot. Did you fix it yourself? I stared at him with a serious look and... I nodded. Yes. That looks like precise work. I'm impressed you picked up medical arts, the man pointed out and I sighed. Being the vice medic of my old team during the pre-war patrols, I picked up a thing or two while reading the books I had about medicine. It's still quite well treated. Are you sure this is all from reading books? I hummed. I guess I also worked on a method to treat this kind of injury. But it's fine. How did you get this hurt? 
Haruzen jumped in with a more serious interest about the previously damaged limb. Did you fight someone strong or dash? Just trampling on cubic forms. I believe I will keep quiet until my commander-in-chief is back from duty. Madara? Tobarama inquired darkly, sighing and getting gloomy at the mention of the Echiha clan leader. He, he will be back in an hour or so. The main battle at the border was won. We will advance tomorrow morning. Yay. And Madara will probably have to employ you once again as our scouts, this time on the main front, the man added. Our main scout force was depleted quite recently and we need to fill up the ranks somehow. Fuck. That meant extra danger, but also not having to handle people like Mu or Inoki for a while. Which was still a win in my book, but... I wasn't really sure if I wanted the trench warfare experience burned in my memory. I will probably have to get Rara and Kagami to not use their Sharingans during the simpler fights, just for the sake of not having them develop PTSD out of normal warfare. Despite my best hopes of spending a jolly day here at the front, my team was quickly dispatched to aid the arrival of supplies to the new forward base established by the border. One step at the time, we were coming closer to IWA. And while this gruesome conflict with the rocks was going to take a while to sort out, I was really hopeful that it wasn't going to be as long as in canon. Not with how much manpower we had, and especially not with both Hashirama, Tobarama, and Madara cooperating against a common enemy. At least I can now start planning out how to keep training while in this war zone. Let's see if I can get the Raisin Shuriken project working without exploding some ally in the process. Chapter 15, Rocky Front Two weeks sure worked brilliantly when you had a reason to not completely dip your head in the squalor that is handling the battlefield. With my team full promotion to what I could only imagine being what I knew as Chunin, since I was now leading a whole platoon with my other teammates acting as seconds in command, I started to take a few key roles during the skirmishes that were finally pushing IWA forces closer to their village. Channeling my inner Oscar von Hudier, I was quick to pick up infiltration and assault tactics meant to destabilize any efforts to build up a solid defense along the front. Our foes were stubborn, but not stupid enough to allow themselves to be encircled at the first chance of an opening in their lines. Just like a fighting force during the Great War, their brightest flaw was their inability to prepare a deeper take on defense. I was blossoming as a brilliant officer because of this, with the morale of the larger group of people now subordinate to me growing at the same pace as their belief that I had gained that position through merit rather than because I was Madara's apprentice. Then again, I doubted anyone smart enough to know who Madara was could exactly say that it was a privileged position to be stuck in. With Hanzo having been sent to Kanoha together with two letters, one aimed to Mito to explain her the situation and the specific issue that needed to be fixed with seals and the other to my mother to explain to her who was the boy that I had requested for my household to foster as a ward of the Shimura clan and why, I was left to fully focus on the thing that was being a proper military officer. Setting orders, giving men and women alike things to do instead of keeping them idle by the moving headquarters. Everything was in constant action, with my own interventions on the fielding pushing more and more on IWA. We were relentless, but nonetheless cautious to not expose ourselves too much in dangerous situations. We were bold, not suicidal. Nonetheless, I also took the few chances of spending some time to get to know who I was head of. I knew who Huratata and Rara were, same for Kagami as the chill Uchiha had been reassigned to serve under my command, but I made the pleasant acquaintance with four more shinobis and two kunoichis that were now relying on my capacity to command this big unit in a fight or in any operation before us. And today was going to be a big one. Listen up, and listen up closely because this is a really important mission and I don't want anyone to miss any detail, I called, rallying the group close within the small section of the available field of the headquarters to make this briefing. Today, we deal IWA a blow they will never forget. How big? Hiratata asked, surprised by the unexpected terminology I used. Generally, I was more specific with my words when it was time to strike particular sections of the hostile army. Right now, 
by using a broader way to describe the best aftermath of that mission, I gave off the idea we were going for something huge. We cripple a third of their forces with a single kill, I replied with a nod. Commander Takagi Arita, the man behind the defenses in the left flank, has been having trouble keeping some of his men from deserting and request imprisonment rather than face execution for mutiny. Some have sung some pretty songs about the location of the much-beloved leader and we know that he has relieved his second-in-command so his death will leave that side of the front line without any stable leadership. That's awfully convenient, Kagami commented and I nodded. Thought the same myself, but I checked on the other things the prisoners have said about other important officers' actions and locations. Those confessions have yet to fail since we managed to kill at least five of those bastards in the last week, and there are plans to get more removed from the board. There's more to this, isn't it? Ryra pressed and I smiled and nodded her way. I guess I couldn't exactly lament the fact these people now know how my crazy mind worked after months of having me around. While we still keep them all imprisoned, some of those IWA ninjas have also given us a way to contact a rough group within their army that is trying to surrender peacefully to our forces. We have kept contacts for a full week now and we have set up a trap against the commander which should theoretically help us avoid most of the dangers a normal assassination attempt normally has. How much can we trust them exactly? Kagami asked with a frown. I mean, surely Madarasama made enough controls, but dash. Kage Bunshins, we accepted personal encounters to disclose info and they were willing to let a couple of their comrades to calmly surrender in a planned meeting, I listed with a serious tone. I can only say this to explain what is going on. IWA is running out of juice with how many defeats it's taking and their village just isn't enjoying the lack of proper food with how many fields we have scorched in the last few months. Ah, how could one forget the fact the battle on the front can easily become secondary if you don't have enough resources to prevent a battle at home? Oh right, I was the one with the knowledge that it was the only logical decline when one was losing this big of a war. This was the first ever war among big villages, so the strains of defeat or multiple of those men on the people back at home meant much more than when it was just clans fighting. Things were easier, smaller, simpler to control, and now things were going to shit for them. Once the briefing was over and the plan of operation explained to the team, we spent an hour or two getting fully prepared for what was going to be a glorious stab onto a Wadakir's soft belly. The trip was meant to take three days of solid walking, with most of the road meant to be clean from any possible obstacle created by IWA soldiers. A blank spot within the scouts' range and their patrols, which was going to give us a safe route into their headquarters on the left side. Much to my relief, these reports proved to be as correct as I had expected them to be. And, while I knew that I had little to doubt about their truthfulness, I still thought with a ninja-like mindset for good enough reasons. Expect the unexpected. Especially when said unexpected could be a sudden blackout that might send you back to a lonely goddess with plans of enslaving humanity. I really didn't need to be thrown back there with how crazy things were here in the real world. The trip was smooth, we recovered a couple of plants that could be used to craft healing ointments and other stuff that were good to be turned into natural medicines with careful use of the basic knowledge about this matter. Other than that, the arrival was where things got a tiny bit spicier. After receding with the small group heading the roguish elements of Iwa's armies, we were meant to begin an exchange that should have guaranteed a safe imprisonment once we were done here. They received special blue jackets that were meant to represent that they were turncoats, while they gave us uniforms akin to theirs so we could have infiltrated the main facility with ease. We were given tags with names, some backstory, and even recommendations from the leaders to be quickly escorted to Commander Takagi. The negotiations began as soon as it started, with the bargain going positively and the two big groups sharing some respectfully formal buys after we began making our way to the main tent of their camps. But before we left our safe zone, I decided to bolster the size of our entourage with two shadow clones. Once inside, the two clones moved in two different directions, with one taking interest in the nearest storage area filled with explosive tags while the other moved to the section where most of the tents were located. 
It was precaution, just a safety measure to prevent any silly business while we went inside the central area of the camp. It was a wide and massive tent that was meant to house the commander's living quarters and the officer's briefing room. Mostly living quarters from how house-centered it all felt as we were taken inside by both guards standing outside by the entrance. Takagi Dano, this is the group of experts that Yokota-san sent to handle the current internal issues within the camp. The man huffed, looking way older than he should be. The losing war and the constant threat of rebellion sure changed the guy for the worse. I can see a lot of children. Explain to me how this is meant to work. Our group has been selectively chosen to take part on dangerous missions entailing possible insurrections against the strong will of the rock. The leading officer nodded, standing up from his chair and looking at the map behind him and giving me the chance of advancing towards him while the two guards were killed as silently as possible. I stopped just in front of his desk as the man began muttering something about aiding a camp three and six. Quick hand signs ensued and, just as expected to, wind ignited through my mouth in a single line of compressed air that easily stabbed through the officer's brain. It was simple, mostly clean as the only blood that came out was the one pushed outward together with brain matter. As the corpse slumped on the ground, I took this opportunity to quickly check on the desk for any useful stuff I could find on it, as I was busy browsing over the surface, the rest of the group moved to follow my example and try finding anything we could bring back to base. The big map that was now stained in blood in its upper corner was stored in a scroll, together with the rest of documents, letters, and other stuff that could have helped in the current war effort. We were so focused onto it that we were caught off guard when we blinked to find fire scorching through a good third of the safe spot we were in. A sudden explosion ripped apart most of the tent, with almost everyone spared by the explosive blast and two of the closer individuals being sent soaring because of the pressure caused by it. Kagami proved to be rather unlucky as he slammed head first on the ground, swiftly clutching the sides as blood poured from some open gashes in there. The smoke started to dissipate, revealing the man responsible behind the attack, or rather, the boy behind it. Anoki looked incredibly angry and pissed, but mostly eager of the opportunity created by this little situation. Danzu-san Today is the day we shall finally fight. God damn it, am I cursed to have crazy bastards after me? I'm not Naruto, go haunt him in the future if you want to steal some funny reactions out of this shit. The circumstances were far from pleasant. Anoki looked determined to not allow this opportunity to go to waste and allow us all to leave. Knowing that he was there, I wouldn't be surprised that Mu was around somewhere for some reason. With Kagami wounded and in need of medical attention, the best solution was only one as much as I detested it. The trip was meant to take three days of solid walking, with most of the road meant to be clean from any possible obstacle created by IWA soldiers. A blank spot within the scouts' range and their patrols, which was going to give us a safe route into their headquarters on the left side. Much to my relief, these reports proved to be as correct as I had expected them to be. And, while I knew that I had little to doubt about their truthfulness, I still thought with a ninja-like mindset for good enough reasons. Expect the unexpected. Especially when said unexpected could be a sudden blackout that might send you back to a lonely goddess with plans of enslaving humanity. I really didn't need to be thrown back there with how crazy things were here in the real world. The trip was smooth, we recovered a couple of plants that could be used to craft healing ointments and other stuff that were good to be turned into natural medicines with careful use of the basic knowledge about this matter. Other than that, the arrival was where things got a tiny bit spicier. After receiving with the small group heading the roguish elements of Iwa's armies, we were meant to begin an exchange that should have guaranteed a safe imprisonment once we were done here. They received special blue jackets that were meant to represent that they were turncoats, while they gave us uniforms akin to theirs so we could have infiltrated the main facility with ease. We were given tags with names, some backstory, and even recommendations from the leaders to be quickly escorted to Commander Takagi. The negotiations began as soon as it started, with the bargain going positively and the two big groups sharing some respectfully formal buys after we began making our way to the main tent of their camps. 
But before we left our safe zone, I decided to bolster the size of our entourage with two shadow clones. Once inside, the two clones moved in two different directions, with one taking interest in the nearest storage area filled with explosive tags while the other moved to the section where most of the tents were located. It was precaution, just a safety measure to prevent any silly business while we went inside the central area of the camp. It was a wide and massive tent that was meant to house the commander's living quarters and the officer's briefing room. Mostly living quarters from how house-centered it all felt as we were taken inside by both guards standing outside by the entrance. Takagi Dano, this is the group of experts that Yokota-san sent to handle the current internal issues within the camp. The man huffed, looking way older than he should be. The losing war and the constant threat of rebellion sure changed the guy for the worse. I can see a lot of children. Explain to me how this is meant to work. Our group has been selectively chosen to take part on dangerous missions entailing possible insurrections against the strong will of the rock. The leading officer nodded, standing up from his chair and looking at the map behind him and giving me the chance of advancing towards him while the two guards were killed as silently as possible. I stopped just in front of his desk as the man began muttering something about aiding a camp three and six. Quick hand signs ensued and, just as expected to, wind ignited through my mouth in a single line of compressed air that easily stabbed through the officer's brain. It was simple, mostly clean as the only blood that came out was the one pushed outward together with brain matter. As the corpse slumped on the ground, I took this opportunity to quickly check on the desk for any useful stuff I could find on it, as I was busy browsing over the surface, the rest of the group moved to follow my example and try finding anything we could bring back to base. The big map that was now stained in blood in its upper corner was stored in a scroll, together with the rest of documents, letters, and other stuff that could have helped in the current war effort. We were so focused onto it that we were caught off guard when we blinked to find fire scorching through a good third of the safe spot we were in. A sudden explosion ripped apart most of the tent, with almost everyone spared by the explosive blast and two of the closer individuals being sent soaring because of the pressure caused by it. Kagami proved to be rather unlucky as he slammed head first on the ground, swiftly clutching the sides as blood poured from some open gashes in there. The smoke started to dissipate, revealing the man responsible behind the attack, or rather, the boy behind it. Anoki looked incredibly angry and pissed, but mostly eager of the opportunity created by this little situation. Danzu-san Today is the day we shall finally fight. God damn it, am I cursed to have crazy bastards after me? I'm not Naruto, go haunt him in the future if you want to steal some funny reactions out of this shit. The circumstances were far from pleasant. Anoki looked determined to not allow this opportunity to go to waste and allow us all to leave. Knowing that he was there, I wouldn't be surprised that Mu was around somewhere for some reason. With Kagami wounded and in need of medical attention, the best solution was only one as much as I detested it. I will delay him. Everyone needs to leave at once. There was surprise at my sudden order, but it was just a silent pause. I could tell both Hiratana and Raira were pondering about this matter, if they should have left me on my own or supported me against my clear wishes. In the end it was Kagami that broke the uneasiness behind that order, giving a quiet okay and spearheading the retreat, soon followed by the entire team leaving as I prepared to do what I told them I was going to do about this unexpected development. Delay Anoki as much as I could in my current circumstances and hope that my sneaky plan actually worked. Finally accepting my challenge, Danza-san? How did you even know I was there? Why are you here? Pure and simple, coincidence many would say. But I know that our meeting was fated, the young man started to explain in the most annoying way possible. I was sent here by my grandfather after he recovered from his recent sickness. He truly seems to be a different person, almost, shocked by what happened with this war. I frowned at that bizarre second half. What do you mean shocked? He caused the war. That's what I thought, but he said something about not remembering and wait, why am I telling you this? Uh, rival's confidentiality? 
I suggested. Would you tell me a secret about your Okage? Not really, I admitted with a hint of nervousness. Would it help the situation if I said his wife seems to be in charge of the affairs when it comes about family-related stuff? What? He exclaimed, genuinely appearing surprised at that comment. I mean let us cease talking and engage in a clash between the rock and the leaf. Rock, paper, kunai? Yes, I mean, no. You know better than me what is going on. We are standing here, staring at each other and... I guess we could play rock, paper, kunai. No! This is the moment where we fight and we become pure representations of the fact our villages are equal in power. I would argue that the state of the war is favorable to my side and dash. Are you going to fight me or are you afraid enough to accept defeat? He demanded, interjecting my important response. I scoffed, miffed at the fact that he interrupted my intellectual speech. Nobody got away from hurting my intellectual feelings. The curse shall pay through ass-beating moves. It's not like you gave me much of a choice. But sure, let's dance, Anoki-san. He smirked, the young teen perhaps thinking this was going to be fair. Oh boy, I was about to crush a future Tsuchikage's vision of what shinobi are meant for. I rushed at him with chakra-boosted speed, his first response being a quick punch. There was a hint of surprise on his face, but I knew already that I was starting from an advantageous situation. While my reserves were far from full and from being on par with his, I knew that I had speed on my side and a cunning understanding in how to murder people with little available. He barely managed to block my counterattack as I stopped to pull a fierce roundhouse kick on his side. The attack was just enough to send him flying and to become a target for several shurikens I managed to throw at him. His armor, albeit minimal in some bits, managed to withstand the ferocious first step of this fight. Grinning, I kept on adding the pressure on the matter as I knew that, at this stage of his life, Anoki was far from being able to use any significant techniques in these conditions. He needed space and some time to get the hand signs right, and I knew that by keeping things limited with taijutsu, I was winning an easy fight against someone that, if given a fair chance, could have easily defeated me. I just couldn't afford to make use of any ninjutsu with how my reserves were in that moment, and so I had to be a cheap hitter and make him lose through peer pressure. I continued to beat the crap out of Anoki, knowing that the youth just wasn't catching up with the fact that he wasn't as prepared in close encounters as he was with chakra-related techniques. Finally, I was putting him on the ropes as I managed to sneak a knee on his stomach, forcing him to bend forward and allow me to slam both my fists in a hammer-like swing that struck him to the ground. He tried standing up, but I further aggravated his poor ribs by kicking him as mightily as I could with my right leg. He rolled away, groaning in pain as he seemed close to passing out because of the massacre he was getting subjected to. But as I approached him once more, I tensed up as I perceived something flying towards me. I jumped away just in time to dodge a flurry of shurikens trying to stab my back, my eyes narrowing and my teeth greeting as I stared right at the reinforcement. Mu was here. He looked modestly pissed considering I had been kicking his apprentices but for a while now, and he really didn't want for the Suchikish grandson to perish in this sad and pitiful way. Shimura san I see that you are alone right now, the man commented flatly. I would have expected for your team to be around for your funeral. Just passing by, I replied to the mummy guy. Still, I hope this isn't too much. He asked for a fight. I believe you have been running around a little too cheekily? I blinked. Truly? How about I just say that I really find that flying technique amazing and now I will lead you all to enjoy some fireworks. The men behind the teacher failed to understand the innuendo behind my words, but the guy himself seemed to catch on pretty quickly as he threw another couple of kunais right my way. The world tore an explosion as the two shadow clones detonated as planned, giving me just the time to make one last jutsu for today. Smoke erupted in my general area, and, while I wasn't around to see the scene unfold, I could only imagine the furious face Mu had to have when he realized that he had attacked a poor innocent log of wood. Kawarimi, you bitch! 
Respect the classics. Respect the law. Just as I sighed in relief, looking around and confirming that I had shifted in the position where I had left the log before approaching the camp. After what happened last time we fought Mu, I started leaving special logs with seals meant to aid my Kawarimi to reach that far away from the location I was planning to use them. The only flaw of this strategy was that I would have to retrieve any unused logs since their seals were still active and could have messed up with my shifting away from danger. Now that I was safe from harm's way, I could rush to regroup with the other and properly leave the area I was in. I was still in the enemy's lines and I needed to report before some morons started any rumors about my possible death. I had enough shit to deal with and I really didn't need someone to happily call out my ultimate demise. Still, as I walked my way through my woods I found out that something just felt, odd. My left arm and leg just felt, slugger than usual. As if those were struggling to move, restrained by something I just couldn't see. I stopped, the phenomenon finally catching onto my brain as I realized that something was really wrong right now. I brought my good hand up and used Kai to release any sudden jinjutsu I hadn't spotted. What I was regaled with was, an ugly situation. A really ugly one at that. A pitch black substance was slowly trying to wrap around that side of my body. It was far from a full quarter of it, but I wasn't exactly planning for the bastard I had just recognized to fully take over my body. Weak as he might be, I wasn't planning to become Zetsu's puppet just because he was latching onto me. I didn't know how, why, or even when, but my current solution was slashing at the inky substance at once. With careful hits, the attack seemed to actually get some damage handled on the parasite, forcing it to detach from my body and slither away to a nearby tree. I kept my eyes on it, a glare leveled on its small shadow-like figure. It didn't take too long for him to speak up. Danzo Shimura The most horrifying manifestation of weed, I flatly remarked. What are you and how did you know I was coming? The tendrils formed a grinning face aimed at me. This isn't the first time I spotted you around, Danza Kuen. I've heard and then seen your prowess in the battlefield from afar. How far exactly? Iwa's court was an interesting place to visit. The Tsuchikage was a fun way to entertain myself before I found someone worthy of becoming my master as my creator. That explained many bad things most of which were stupidly concocted now that I thought about it. I mean, the first Suchikage was never portrayed in a way that made him stand out as a war supporter. Heck, he was rather humble from the way the anime showed him to be. Adding this irrational decision to what Anoki had said. Oh, so Zetsu pulled a move similar to what Toby did with the Mizukage, the guy that started the bloody mist crisis. Except the citizens were dying from war in this case rather than being murdered by their own soldiers. Yep, now I can see the cunning behind this plan. Still. Master. What do you mean? I couldn't help but find your impressive potential worthy of providing my servitude to you. What? I inquired in pure confusion. A young child with such a brilliant mind. I can't help but recognize the same potential of the founder of the Echiha family, the man that started your mentor's clan. Ah, I see what he is trying to do here. Just like he did with Indra, Zetsu was trying to coax me to accept it as a boon rather than the parasite he really was. Still, this offered me a fun chance to kill many issues that were going to come forth if he was left alive. Oh, you mean Indra? You know... Hagoromo's oldest child and the one you induced to stray from the family out of a jealousy fit? Yes, wait. What? Look, let's cut things short right here. I know who you really are, I know what you are planning to do, and right now, you made a terrible mistake in trying to manipulate me into becoming your happy puppet. You know nothing, child. I know your mommy is a bunny with divine ambitions, I flatly commented, getting him shocked enough to throw a single kunai in his direction. He seemed to scowl at the flimsy attack, moving just a little to dodge the sharp projectile, but failing to catch on the fact that an explosive tag was tied to it. I could only nod at how easily I killed Black Zetsu. 
It felt so easy that I had to patrol around the area to make sure I wasn't just stuck in some other Jinjutsu. I felt my grin widening as I found no sign of the bastard being around. Since he had yet to bond with a clone of Hashirama, he couldn't pull the plant thing just yet, so I knew that, if he was around, he had to be around somewhere if he had survived the blast. Eagerly making my hasty retreat back to the temporary camp where everyone was supposedly waiting for me so we could start returning to the headquarters, I couldn't help but grin at the fact that I had literally eliminated one of few things that could potentially bring Kagaya back to life. Like seriously, I just couldn't believe it had happened and it took me hours to eventually understand how lucky things had gone my way. Despite the big success on this front, the biggest issue for my current state of happiness manifested in the form of Madara handing out some unpleasant news for my platoon. We were being moved away from the front against IWA and relocated to the joint front made with Kiridakure against Kumogakure. Everyone looked particularly gloomy over the fact we were going to march through Yugakure, the land of hot water, and Shimogakure, the land of frost, which meant we were going to have our first and funniest beach episode together. But of course, the only beaches we were going to see was the one we were going to land onto since I planned to once again revolutionize the battlefield with another brilliant antic tactic. We're gonna make the Marines proud, Aura. Chapter 16, Dark Clouds Relocating to another front was not as simple as the words sounded to be. A full month passed since I received the message requesting our transfer to the Kumo front line, and the long march was one of the coldest and most unforgiving walks across the world that I could have hoped for. Sure, I had pondered about going someplace like Yuki no Kuni anytime soon, but it was only a joking thought about it. There was no way I was going to check the place just yet. I needed to first get strong enough to know about possible assassins plotting against me and my family. This occurrence, the one that saw my platoon moving through these neutral lands, was only possible because a diplomatic exchange was brokered by Yuzushio Vikure. In exchange for fishing rights and some good sea zones that were usually controlled by Yuzushio, these small villages were to allow the contingent, which my team and the four more same-sized ones made most of it, to reach Kumovikur's territory through their land border. It was a little sketchy on the diplomatic level since a mistake in our plans would have easily taken these weak forces into a war against our enemies, and we couldn't spare men just yet to assist those villages if our foes decided to invade them. The march through the cold tundra of Yuki no Kuni reminded me why I love mild winters to Siberian ones. Even with a lot of clothes on, some warming seals, and a couple of pauses in warm shelters, I still learned to despise the climate and wonder if we were eventually going to be blessed with an improved love for our country by the time we were back in warmer plots of land. Still, the reason why we were meant to cross the border by land was something that had me slightly irked. For dumb reasons. Tobarama Senju was in charge of this big front. Until a few weeks earlier, his efforts were mostly secondary to Kiridakure's attempts to secure a beachhead with their modest transport fleet. It was successful at first, with a couple of strategic points being captured. Sadly, any defense proved to be in vain as Kumonin proved to be better prepared in land-based fighting compared to seafaring ones. New efforts tried this again, but none managed to actually breach the reinforced defenses deployed by the cloud. Almost two months of weak attempts to beat the first invasion successes, and still there wasn't much of a hope to break through. So, Tobarama, in a moment of utter wisdom, decided that instead of allowing Kirigakure to kill his own men and women by throwing them in waves at their well-defended enemies, the best way to win this stalemate was to shatter the hostile lines from another side. Which is why we had been relocated in this part of the world, tasked with the plan of breaching the enemy's defenses on the sides, and allow a couple of beachheads to form and consolidate. What really pissed me of this plan was that I wasn't going to have the chance to educate my platoon about becoming raiders and marines, but about infiltrating places like the Airborne. It was still nice, but I had this pseudo-powerpoint explanation for turning my cute soldiers into marines and now that speech was gone and forever forgotten. The tragedy, the despicable nature of everything. Nonetheless, the fun plan for this endeavor was undeniably good enough to keep my rage under control since I was still going to do something funny. 
who wouldn't be happy busting bunkers from their blind spots? I really need to ask two weeks of rest after we're done with Kumo. I'm so close to just snap in full Warhawk mode if I don't get the chance of being at peace with myself. Either by resuming gardening duty or even training in complete silence and on my own. Listen up, this is going to be a jolly ride with a couple of bumps across the road, I started to say, drawing my platoon's attention on me. We were resting inside a modest-sized tent that was meant to be our temporary HQ while we were away from the other members of our contingent. Two hours from now, Toberamasan's forces, combined with Kiri's finest, will storm the beaches and, definitely, we will get some results done with that objective. Our task is to go along the beach line, destroy any fortification or combatants along the way while also aiding any of the invasion forces that require assistance. What kind of assistance? One of the Kunoichis I just started to know about asked. I believe her name is... Hiroko? Considering that they were lasting a fair lot under my command and had yet to beg to be reassigned elsewhere, I was growing fond of my fodders, I mean loyal men. I totally meant loyal men. Still, I knew Hiroko, red eyes and blue hair, and Wakiko, blue eyes and green hair. Then there were the four guys that were Yudamara, green eyes and dark hair, Masahide, brown eyes and gray hair, Sitaro, brown eyes and dark hair, and Tez Sai, blue eyes and blue hair. A rainbow of minions that were eagerly giving me their loyalty to me. And in exchange, I gave them the best orders to see the next day. I really was slowly getting annoyed by the war-centered mindset I was developing. I wasn't scared or anything, I really needed to be given the chance to sit, yawn, and then nap. It's been a while since I was given the opportunity to enjoy a power nap, with the only resting being during nighttime. We will be flanked with engineers, with our main priority being medical issues. We find wounded, and we deal with them. Understood? They all nodded, with Kagami taking a while to do so. What about the after we are done with this? Do we have a specific retreat order or do we have to assist in keeping up with the pressure? Fair enough, we had been forced to give pursuit during our times in IWA when it came to post-important operations. We were hounds meant to give extra pain for each retreat of the enemy's army. But now, we weren't in the conditions to do so. Not with the current circumstances, that it. We shall retreat to Toborama San's position, then debrief about the situation at the front. Why can't we just keep up the pressure? Logistics, Hiratatakuin, I replied calmly to the Huga's surprise. Our main force is the invading army, and even if they managed to flawlessly land, they would still need to set up temporary docks to allow more manpower in and fill up the army properly. That's why our objective is to see for the beachheads to form and consolidate. I understand, the boy quietly answered and I nodded before resuming my own explanation. The main goal is to destroy any defenses we find. We have been spared more high-tier explosive tags than usual, so be careful when you use your normal tags around because you might mistakenly use a boosted one, I prepared to conclude that briefing. Finally, we will have friendlies around to join our very mission. If you spot someone and you are uncertain of their allegiances because of a different uniform or because you can't spot the forehead protector, then ask for permission to take the hit. Understood? Yes, Danza-san, they all replied at once and I smiled. Good, then. I believe we can start right now, I hummed happily, giving another nod and setting up the formation to begin the big operation. With me as the head of the group, I was flanked by Hiratata and Kagami, with Ryra standing directly behind me. The rest of the platoon was disposed of in a copy of this lesser formation, creating a diamond-like pattern that easily offered us a small, but compacted attack formation. We were the second group to begin with our respective tasks, spotting quite easily another platoon as big as mine making its ways to further back defenses while we took care of the closest ones to the beach. The first bunker we spotted was actually a small structure made of wood that had been done in haste and with a couple of foundation's flaws. Placing just two explosives, we didn't even need to fight the dangerous squad housed inside of it. 
The tags detonated, shredding through the wood, sending splinters everywhere, and setting fire on the parts that weren't devastated completely by the explosion. Screams filled my ears as I sternly ignored the noises coming from fire we had created, already shifting my focus on the next defensive position. This one was a little more tougher since there were a couple of guards keeping patrol around the perimeter surrounding the better-built bunker. Taking them out without alerting the garrison was a little bit tough, but with the numbers at our disposal, we ended up getting through after just 20 minutes. Kumonin seemed to be less aware of their surroundings. They were keen to not remain in a single spot for long in complete contrast with IW Anin, which highlighted how weak their defensive capacity was, with their strength being attacks. The pattern was the same for six of those small positions, with none seeming to be genuinely more fortified than the others. But as the first hour started to come to an end, a troublesome element appeared before our very eyes. Are those our boats? Ryra asked slowly, her eyes unable to identify if those were indeed ours. I swiftly turned to stare at the direction she was looking at, and I felt my jaws dropping and my disbelief doubling the moment I realized how bad the situation really was. For some unknown reason, the invasion had begun way too early and, and we had to speed up our current pace if we wanted to lessen the horrible toll this was going to take. I doubted this was Toborama's idea, but I was pissed that he still went through with this despite how stupid it was. I took a moment to produce a shadow clone and send it to quickly alert the rest of the contingent. I was quite sure that we weren't the only ones knowing of this and it was only for the best that we didn't remain the only ones to know this issue. I quickly ordered to increase the pace, already feeling that this wasn't going to be easy. Aren't they invading too early? Kagami asked with frustration dripping from his voice. Yep, I muttered annoyed. Change of plans. We now have the task of aiding any struggling force we found by the shore. Courtesy of some high-up moron that decided to start the attack too early. They didn't contact us? Hiratata asked. W. Why would they miss this? Perhaps this was decided when we were already in action. The timing is fairly unpleasant. And it wasn't just the timing that was grating at my nerves. It was just a couple moments after that conversation that we had to stop and spread out as one of the bunkers had gone fully active and was starting to pin down some of the attackers. Lighting-based techniques were quickly thrown at our allies, the men leaving the boats getting slaughtered because there was no genuine cover for them to take to avoid the brutal massacre. We quickly moved into place various explosives at the edge of the fortification, once again allowing for the bunker to collapse, this time the entire structure coming down the moment the bombs came off. The carnage was brought to an end, but the results were still fairly grim. Two entire boats had been decimated by a small squad defending the area. It was surreal how much blood was spilled with such ease, but the worst had yet to come. As soon as the vicious counterattack was suppressed with accurate violence, I personally took Wakiko and Masahai with me to check for any survivors by the shore. Lots of guts, lots of blood, but a single shivering form that seemed to be mostly fine. Curled in a fetal position by one of the small holes created on the wet sand, a young boy was suffering from an acute form of shell shock. I was the closest and thus I moved in to treat the large wood splinter embedded on his right leg. You will be fine, I will soothe the pain and dash. I I killed them. What? I I couldn't do anything. I just I just stared in, and they died. They died so suddenly, and, and I killed them. I could only flinch as I realized that the child was suffering a clear dangerous form of survivor's guilt. I hadn't studied much on the matter back in my previous life, but I knew how lesser forms than the one I was looking at could easily turn suicidal without proper care from others. Without wasting time, I delivered a sudden but decisive punch. It wasn't meant to damage, but to put him to sleep as I handled his wound and prepared him to be checked on by specialized experts once we were done here in the field and the full coastal beachhead was secured. The rest of the operation took a grittier turn of events as we found similar-looking situations on a frequent basis the more we rushed to get all defenses destroyed. The number of losses was absurd, 
and I really thought that the sea was going to genuinely turn red with how many dead people we ended up finding along the way. A good two-third of the entire invasion force still managed to get through, and the assault was regarded as a costly but complete victory for once. Despite the good news, none of those that had survived the onslaught that was invading with a good part of the bunkers still operative seemed to be happy with the loss count. It was something that had me fairly furious and in need of proper retaliation once I was done with this. And I had many things to ask now that I was supposed to give the debriefing to Tobarama himself. The enemy force has yet to organize a counterattack, Tobarama announced with a serious tone. I believe they are trying to build up an engineer corps to quickly reach the destroyed fortifications and rebuild them. I was sitting with the other officials while the man was going through with the debriefing. We were all modestly pissed and ready to offer a serious rant on the matter. It was sheer respect for the military mind within Tobarama's brain that we weren't throwing shouts already. The first bit of the meeting continued smoothly and ended with a pleasant explanation that there was enough material to be able to make some serious pushes the moment the rest of the army had been deployed. He barely mentioned those that were responsible for the assault all over Kumo's first lines of defense, but I knew he was planning to speak more about it once he was done addressing the officers behind the invasion. Just as expected, he finally took his attention to us and our reaction. I would also like to bring up the valor displayed by the group of saboteurs that have been dispatched to make sure that our landing was the safest possible, the white-haired man commented. Their participation in this operation was essential and awe-inspiring. There was a round of applause at that, but it wasn't a long one as Tobarama kept on speaking. Still, I believe there are a couple of legitimate grievances regarding the sudden and reckless beginning of the operation. Some officers from Kiri had managed to convince their high command to begin the mission much earlier, coming close to jeopardizing the entire plan with their behavior, the strict man commented. The Mazukage was alerted of the matter, and there is a serious investigation being resolved as we are speaking. It will take a while, but I've received confirmation that new officers have already been enlisted to deal with these crucial duties while their predecessors are being checked on for any dangerous elements. Well, that solves a big part of my anger at that matter. Still, I was irked by the fact that we were dragged to suffer losses because of some morons from Kiri. The toll couldn't just be ignored that easily, and I was worried that this change of the guard was hardly going to cut off any impatient bastard trying to rush things up on this front. After the meeting was over, Tobarama pulled me aside and handed me a scroll. He had an annoyed expression plastered on his face as he did so. You did well during your first mission on this front, Shimurakuin, he let out a flat praise. Your sensei sent a letter aimed at you. I didn't see any reason to see what content was inside, but I suspect it's quite important, which is why I saw it fit to set up a tent for you to use to check on the message. I offered a slow nod, surprised that the man was actually this calm about the matter. I definitely needed to write to Haruzan after I was done with this. Last message I received was just three days ago, but he mentioned that he was being placed on guard duty by the rear guard since most of the main force was knocking at Iwa's door by now. He was certainly able to receive a letter since he was in such a tame stage of his duty on that front line. After being granted permission to leave, I quickly walked around to try and find where the tent that was assigned was really located. I wandered for some time, but I ended up finding out the precise spot where it was. I entered inside and the small tent that I was offered was decisively one of the smallest I had to be inside, but I didn't mind the size as my attention was on the bed in there. The mattress was a little rough to my back, but it was quite far from the worst place I've been laying myself on. I was finally alone with my thoughts and the message from Sensei. I sighed calmly as I quietly pondered about what kind of things the man might have written on that letter. I stared at the scroll in complete silence, but my impatience had it better as I decided to quickly remove the ribbon keeping it in such neat form and unravel the paper for me to read the content held inside. To the Rikagun Choi, 1. Shimura Danzo I write this letter to address a couple of matters that I believe you will be most interested about. Starting from the fact that the conflict with IWA is coming to an end. 
I believe that in a month or two from when I sent you this letter, Iwabikur will face internal collapse as the officers are keeping on fighting despite their kage and now seeking to bring a conclusion to this fight. I'm not sure how exactly long it will take for drastic attempts for peace to come, but Hashirama has already been alerted and he is working to prepare a proper peace deal with our enemies so we can all focus on Kumo and his last ninjas. I will take a little longer to finally leave that side of the world. Hashirama requested for me to serve as his guard during the diplomatic meeting between and at Suchikich to conclude a proper finale to this last part of the conflict. It's certain that I will be able to take part in the next front with a substantial control of the main force. I hope you understand that, due to my duties as your sensei, I shall stake claims to have you under my command. Alas, I suppose you have received letters from Kanoha. Your mother is as worried as usual, Hanzo Kuen was properly treated by Mito and he is currently living in your household as a ward of the Shimura clan, and Yoshiko-san is going to take the graduation test to be then enlisted in a couple of months from now. From what Mito told me, she is ready to succeed in this endeavor. Finally, I hope your first mission is going fine. I expect a lot, but I know you will manage to exceed any expectations I build around you. Until next time. Madara Uchiha. How am I supposed to reply to this message? Sure, I could have just replied with a simple I will win the war before either you or Yoshiko are brought in this final stage of the conflict or something even dumber than that. I really didn't want to go through any informal stuff since I really, really needed to get something to cheer me up and bring me out of my current state of irritation, annoyance and tiredness. The mattress felt surprisingly comfy now that I was sleepy, but I didn't plan to catch some rest until I knew the rest of the team was capable of doing so themselves. I was really pushing to get this genuine idea that I wasn't a selfish prick that had privileges over my own subordinates not just because of the rep, but also because I really didn't need to feel someone legitimately having a reason to call me a self-centered brat. Still, I needed a proper way to address Madara's letter and a devious idea came up to my mind. It was so devious that for a moment I was frightened by myself for feeling so ballsy, so daring. It all came to the fact that I knew how to tease the man without getting punished by it. In fact, if I had predicted his behavior as well as I hoped to, then I knew what was going to get him antsy and interested at the same time. So I started to write a proper letter, but purposely leading a small space between to my and Madara Uchiha. I went on about the fact that I was surely going to win the war before he had the chance of leaving his guarding duty. That and Yoshiko entering active duty. I now had the chance of trying to make this work, even though I doubted logistics favored me in this very circumstance. Finally, the cherry atop the fun cake I deliberately started to write father, only to stop halfway to cross it out, leaving just sensei as the only way to address the clan leader. He was going to notice, he was going to consider all eventualities, and, in the end, that mere possibility will keep on hunting him for the rest of his life, until I would say to him it is just a prank, sensei. Then again, maybe not this bluntly and not without a couple layers of protection. Maybe I could ask Hashirama or Mito to assist me in this. I didn't trust myself in not gloating and bragging around the man, so I needed some protection to not face the ultimate punishment. After I was done writing a response to the letter and having it handled by the ninja assigned to this very task, I proceeded to make my way to where my platoon had been resting and waiting for me to come back. But as I began talking with Ryra about the current situation, I couldn't help but stare at the sleeping form that was the boy we had recovered from the beach. Familiar, unconscious and afflicted by numerous mental problems caused by the horrors he had to witness. This was hardly going to end well for all of us, yet I was sure of one thing. This sure is a hell of a, of a beach episode. That's the end of this tale for subscribe if you enjoyed like the video cause why not? And comment down below your thoughts. Anyways with that being said peace.